mechanic is somebody who can fix them. An auto mechanic fixes a car, a body mechanic is a professional killer. I'm a card mechanic, I can fix a card game. Ace of cards, Richard Turner. He can do things with cards no one else can do. He's a trickster. He is demonstrating the moves used by cheaters. The most difficult things you can do with a deck of cards. I represent why you should never play cards with strangers. <laughs> When I saw Richard Turner perform, I was in the presence of greatness. And, and he also thought there was a cheater in the tape, in the game. That was one of the reasons why he wanted me to uh, enter the game, to see if there was another cheater in that game, because he always lost. And he, the, the odds were against him losing as much as he did. So that was one of the other elements to the story. So all of a sudden, I picked up the deck of cards, and I said, there's two cards missing. And... Uh, the banker leans over and says, how can you pick up a deck and tell two cards are missing? And I thought, oops, I guess that showed a certain level of skill. Hi, and welcome. It's Runchex, and you're listening to my podcast where I explore the topics around what it takes to become a great poker player with various interesting people from in and around poker industry. Today, my guest is Richard Turner, the best card mechanic in the world and one of the best close-up magicians. He has won many prestigious awards for his achievements in magic. The documentary about him, which is called Delt, is one of the best documentaries that I've ever seen. Richard's life, his achievements, his adventures are so inspiring. It is impressive that one man can achieve so much. And speaking of that, he is a 6th degree black belt in karate, and it's even more impressive when you realize that his black belt test was so tough that it was televised. And there are many more remarkable things about him that I didn't even mention yet. In this conversation, Richard shares so many fascinating stories. I hope you will enjoy it, and I warn you, when I first found out about Richard's story a couple years ago, I ended up spending weeks looking up all the videos of his performances. It is a rabbit hole, and after listening to this episode, you will very likely go down there as well. And now, enjoy the amazing Richard Turner. Well, Richard, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, It's such a pleasure. My pleasure, my pleasure. All right. Well, Richard, I want to introduce you to my audience Perhaps from, you're such a multifaceted person, but I want to zoom in on one aspect. Uh, You know, in the world of cards and card magic, there's the world of card mechanics and the card sharks. You are part of that world, right? And and if we think, like, as far as I understand, even for the close-up magicians, they would usually not go into card mechanics because it's too difficult. Which that is makes so true. yeah, so which makes the card mechanics an elite club, and if we think about that elite club of people, you are to say that you are in the top one percent, that would be an understatement. Things that you can do, there's pretty much like just a couple people in the world that can do some of the things that you're able to do with cards. Is that a fair statement? Uh, that is very true. And there's some things I do with the cards that nobody can do and probably no one will ever be able to do. Right. Because they're not as crazy as I am. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, you know, I I really wanted to point this out because I want people to understand that, you know, oftentimes everybody's talking top 1%, top 1%. We're talking about a unique individual here. You are one and you know, the second best is quite below that. Because like you said, maybe there's nobody as crazy as you are in, in this world with the cards. Yep, and I've started working with cards 57, 58 years ago, which dates me. And uh, it was, like I said, when I say crazy, there was a period of time when I practiced 10 to 20 hours a day. And I sustained that discipline for 26 years straight, seven days a week. And uh, my average practice hour, practice day was 14 hours. That was the average time. And then when my uh, son was born, he would start slobber all my cards. And so that uh, curtailed a little bit of my practice time. And then when I have to deal with computers, emails, and things along that line, that also cut into some of my practice time. So 
Now I put in between three to 10 hours a day. Um, but for, for uh, 26 years, it was average of 14 hours a day. And that is basically Gladwell's rule of 10,000 hours to be a, become a master at something times 15. I have about 150,000 hours behind a deck of cards. I actually had a three to six deck a day habit at one point. Wow. This is, <laughs> this is incredible. And also, like speaking of practice, you know, you just casually say you practiced 14 hours a day. And I know that you famously said uh, many times that it's not that practice makes you perfect, is that perfect practice makes you perfect. So we're not talking about some random practice just shuffling a deck of cards. You were really going at it into the details for 14 hours average per day. That is exactly right. Uh, when, I'm, when I say practicing or I'm not fiddling with cards, people see cards in my hand, they, think I'm, they might think I'm just fiddling them or shuffling, shuffling them. Not a single card when they think it's coming off the top is coming off the top. Not a single shuffle that I'm doing is an actual shuffle. They're all a false or fake shuffle. So I'm constantly analyzing and then uh, practicing the moves and how I approach the work with the cards is first I analyze what my objective is, you know, to deal a, a second deal in a certain method that gets rid of all the tells. And so I'll analyze the move, break it down piece by piece and tell every exacting element of the muscle memory is firmly embedded in my brain and then what I do is I slowly speed it up and, uh, and then I turn it into what I call a subconscious habit where we all have nervous energy that we're burning off, like twiddling our thumbs or tapping our fingers or tapping our toes. That's idle energy that's being wasted. So I take that idle energy and I focus it into uh, practicing moves even subconsciously. Wow. So full efficiency in terms of using your time. Yes, big time. You, you don't want to waste that efficiency. And in fact, I have friends that will tell you they've caught me practicing while I'm sleeping. I can actually sleep with a deck of cards in my hand and all night long they will not fall out of my hands. <clears throat> it shows you how the power of the subconscious. I actually went through two surgeries and I asked the surgeon, I said, can I leave the cards in my hand while we go through the surgery? I just wanted to see what would happen if I was medically knocked out and one of them I lost about 13 of the cards and the other one I maintained the deck wow wow and this sort of explains why you're not just the one percent you're you're it you're the top in, uh, yeah, in I, your I'm field weirdo. yeah <laughs> fantastic Richard there are so many things I would love to talk about with you and let's start with the obvious i usually talk about poker my audience wants to know about poker and you happen to be on the other end of the poker game you know for us poker players the way we see the game it's all about the decisions it's all about the players etc cetera, etc cetera. we don't much think about the cards being dealt we don't much think about the dealers apart from occasional outburst on uh how how they make us lose uh, but the way you see the deck of cards the way you see the game is a completely different perspective is a completely different world yes because my job is to control the outcome of a game you mentioned card mechanic card magician card shark and there's a big difference you know magicians will use cards for the purposes of entertainment a card mechanic is somebody who can control the outcome of a card game. So I'm constantly figuring out ways to take a deck of cards, depending on the game, and with and following the normal procedure without breaking procedure or using any form of misdirection, how I can uh, make the person I want to win, win, the person I want to lose, lose, and so forth. And for, and for the most part, you know, I use this as a form of entertainment. I'm not a professional cheater. And that's not to say that there wasn't a period of time in my life when I wasn't using my skills for a game because I grew, that's how I grew up. Uh, but I do, I use it as a, a form of entertainment and, uh, and it basically can scare the gamble out of a gambler because like you said, uh, the 
typical card player is looking at it as what are my two cards going to be if it's holding? What's the flop going to uh, uh, hold and how's it going to relate to my hand? That's what they're thinking about. They're not thinking about where those cards are coming from and what part of the deck they may be coming from and, uh, and, and what that, uh, that uh, dealer is actually able to do to control that, to control the game. Right, right, exactly. And I've seen some of the things that you can do, and it's mind-boggling. It seems impossible. I know that famously even Di Vernon, who, who is the person who uh, fooled Houdini, yes. he couldn't believe what you were able to do. And he couldn't yeah. figure it out. Even when you explained to him what you're doing, he still couldn't believe that it's possible. That is true, and that's where I'm kind of fortunate in that I have a very unusual touch. And uh, there's a neuroscientist from Harvard who basically stated that I have one of the most developed tactile neural networks of anybody on planet Earth. Those are his words. And so because I have such a fine touch that enables me to do things with cards that others can't do and if and they may spend 30 years just getting halfway there on one move and yet they still can't put it to its purpose mm -hmm. and Di Vernon was a wonderful man I was very privileged to have spent 17 years with him and to give your audience a little background he was probably the, the, he was the best card man for 60 years from like 1920 to the 1980s and he lived to be almost 100 years old. And he took me under his wing back in 1975. And he saw in me the same kind of craziness that he had towards gambling and gambling moves. And so I, I became the recipient of a century worth of his most guarded card table information, information that he set, sought out through the world, finding professional hustlers and gamblers. And he either would trick them or in whatever method he could used to get them to tip their work that's that's what he did and then that was that is some of the most closely guarded information is the tech, the work for the card table and like you said i would do things i'll give your audience a, a for instance you can take and shuffle up a deck of cards you can tell me what card game you want to play we'll say my favorite game seven card stud you can tell me how many players you want at the table so you want five now i'll ask you where do you want to sit you're my secret partner you might say three and I will start, I can deal it out and I will let anybody take the cards out of my hand as I deal and further shuffle the cards, keep cards out of the deck and still that third position at a five player table will come up with a straight flush, full housework, four of a kind, whatever it is I ended up putting together for that player. So that's, that's just to give the audience an idea. And there's, there's uh, videos all over YouTube showing uh, me doing just things along these lines. And uh, another, for instance, you can, I'll ask you, what's your favorite card? You might say seven. And I'll say, how many players do you want? Six. I'll say, where do you want to sit? Four. I'll give the deck three casino shuffles, three riffle shuffles, pass the deck to you or a uh, spectator and say, deal them out. And as they deal, the fourth, 10th, 16th, and 22nd card off that deck would be a seven. So the fourth player at a six player table ended up with the cards you selected. So put it in a nutshell, I shuffled your cards back in the deck exactly where you chose and you dealt them to prove that I did it. That's, that's a, for instance, to give, to give people a, a kind of a, a, a description or a explanation or a, an idea of what we're talking about. Hmm. And it is incredible as a feat. In a normal game, when people are just playing cards, they don't pay that much attention. Attention. So you're not going to be put in a situation where somebody is going to take the deck out of your hands, shuffle it, give it back to you. You deal one card each, shuffle it again. Your your life is easy when you're if you were to deal a it's regular a poker game. That would be oh, easy. That's it's a walk in the park. Stuff. Exactly. Yeah, that'd be, that's a piece of cake, man. Because I, I, that's just showing you how far I can push the envelope. In a regular game, uh, it's uh, a piece of cake because when I'm when you're performing or demonstrating, you have to fill your hand. You can't just end up with a pair of uh, or trips or something. You have to have a, a good strong hand to make it impressive. 
in a game, you don't need that kind of uh, hand to come out ahead. Yeah. And especially, you know, when you're performing, people know you're performing and they're watching you. Whereas yes. when you're dealing a regular home game or a regular, well, let's, let's zoom in on the home game. You know, nobody's paying attention. Nobody's, even if they're watching, they're not going to spot anything. Your moves are completely flawless. You can deal the second card. You can deal bottom of the deck. Um, all these things, and obviously, you can deal from probably anywhere in the deck, I would assume. Yeah, yeah I can deal at middles anywhere in the deck. You can, you can say, I want the 22nd card to come out of the seventh position. So, if we talk about like you are special that much we understand so the likelihood that you are dealing a local home game that's very low you know which is obviously you have no interest in doing any of that stuff and in fact we we can talk about later uh, about some of the approaches you had from the mafia where they wanted to get you in uh, as a dealer but let's leave it for for a minute first so let's imagine there is an average, and I don't know what is an average card mechanic, right? But there's a card mechanic who, let's say, is not as obsessive. You know, he might might have been practicing for five years or something. How much can he do in a card game? Well, it doesn't take a lot. Like he maybe he has he's developed a strike second and a peak. So uh, we're uh, dealing. Let's say blackjack. You, you maybe sometimes you play blackjack in a home game, but usually it's poker. But say blackjack, just to know one card can create the uh, can control the outcome. In other words, you peak, you have you subterrace, you secretly peak the top card, and you know you're sitting on a ten, and you know you and your down card is a five, and so that a six would fill your hand. And so when you, you pick that card, you know when that six is there, and then you will just start going into seconds to deal and then deal yourself that six, fill in your hand. Or conversely, you can uh, uh, know that that person, your partner at the table sitting on a, a 15, and you deal, the, you deal the, that six to your partner. Or the other way around, your partner is sitting on a, a 11, and, in, and they double down, you deal them a deuce or a three. And so they end up losing twice. So it, it doesn't, doesn't take that kind of work. And historically, most hustlers spent their life learning one or two moves. Either say they're a bottom dealer. Okay, they, they developed the techniques of being able to uh, deal a card off the bottom. They had to learn basically two moves because then there was the cut they had to get around. Either they had to have a partner at the table that would hit a brief. A brief is like a little... A uh, jogged card or a bent card, or some way where when they go to cut the deck, they'll cut to that point, and then that was restoring the uh, cards back to the bottom. So, or they had to be able to undo the cut with a, what's called a shift or a hop. They either hop the cut or they would shift the uh, the deck, nullifying the cut. So the uh, so that then they may have spent 10, 5, 10, 15, 20 years developing those two moves. It was a guy named Alan Kennedy that Professor Vernon sought out, 1930, 31, 32, who supposedly was able to deal a card from the middle of the deck. And, uh, and in that case, you didn't have to get around the cut because you just went you, you just went straight to your cards that were in the center. And of course, that's a, a whole different uh, skill set. And and uh, actually, I think uh, I think other uh, other moves are better than dealing out of the middle, even though I enjoy dealing out of the middle other other things you might uh you just might uh shuffle the cards in such a way that you can run up two cards so you have pocket aces opening and uh and that and that doesn't take the same level of skill so it, do, it doesn't take the same amount of work over the long term to create an advantage and sometimes just knowing the location of one card or a single card that doesn't come into play can create a statistical advantage one of the things I, I did growing up is I would take and uh, the aces and kings, I would make sure they were shuffled and they went after the cut, they would end up towards the bottom so they wouldn't come into play. And just that alone turns the, uh, the, the queens and jacks into the power cards. The queens now become the aces. So in other words, 
if I if I'm sitting on a pair of queens and uh, um, or say we're playing seven stud five stud and they have an ace up and I have a queen up and I have a queen in the pocket, I know they're not going to be they're not going to have a pair of aces because I killed them. I killed them. So just knowing where some cards are or that will or will not come in the game can create a statistical advantage over the long term. So that's how simple things can get. And even in the casinos, uh, they a, a dealer might signal to their agent, their partner at the table, all they have to do is just they just tap the deck on their chest where you're sitting on a, on a 15 and I have a five up. You're supposed to stay there. I just tap my uh, chest just squ- as, if, as, if, as if I'm squaring up the deck and I signal to you, you want to hit that, that 16 or that 15 because I'm sitting on a, uh, I have a good card down below. So you, you don't, you would not play the, the, st- the typical odds that you would play on a, on a particular hand just by, just by a simple signal. And in private games, probably the most common way their, the players will take advantage over a few other players is called team play. You might have, if you have three players at the table, an eight player table, eight, eight seat table, and three of you is called signing up by the way I hold my cards in my hand. I'm telling you, I'm sitting on a straight, I'm sitting on a full house. I'm sitting on, on trips. And what, what you do is you play high hand. The other two people, even though they're sitting on a good hand, they just fold out and then uh, let high hand play. And that doesn't take anything more than just secret signals between the players. On And it might be how they're holding their cards, the three fingers on the side. And when they hold them, it tells you trips, four finger, four of a kind. You know, it doesn't take very much to create an advantage by just signaling, signaling to your partners. And that's but then that was really the case in the poker pits, even in the casinos, because the casinos really didn't care about that because they just took a rate from the uh, from the winner. So the the team play, they didn't really do a whole lot about it. But now that when they started the world championship of poker and stuff, they had to uh, cut out the team play by randomizing the tables and who went to which table. You couldn't pick the table you went to for that very reason. Mm, right, right. Let's circle back to what you've mentioned about um, in a casino setting. Somebody might, well, the dealer might signal his partner. How is that done? Is that usually just a peek? That would be uh, that would be one of the things they just take, peek that top card, and now they uh, they know that top card what what or what it cannot do for that player, mm-hmm. and uh, and then like I said, uh, if they. It, well, usually it would be if they like, let's, let's give another example. Say they have an ace up, you know, they have, a, they, have they, they used to have to peek the card. Now they stop for this very reason. They'd know if they had a natural or not. You know, if they had a natural, they'd show it. They'd turn over the face card down below showing that blackjack. But if they didn't, once again, uh, with an ace up and you have, depending on if you have a 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, you know, bust hand, you're supposed to hit. But maybe he, he he's sitting on a, well, no, that's not a good example. Anyway, it, it, just by signing up, like I said, can can tell another player to hit or not hit. Mm-hmm. All right. Because if I'm thinking about the modern poker game in the casino, there's a card shuffling machine, which yes. makes things much harder for, for any sort of uh, tricks from the dealer. Does it eliminate any sort of card mechanic? Well, actually, they're, they're, in most casinos, it's really the safest place to play because the security is so tight and the cameras are everywhere. But the, it's, it, it, things have actually flipped. It's the casinos trying to protect, protect themselves against the player now because the card counters and then there's people that are able to do what's called tracking, tracking the cards as they go into the shuffling machine. And then they'll know when a slug of cards will come back out and they'll have the whole table sewn up. In other words, everybody at that table are in on it together and they have what's called the BP, the big player, usually sitting at the second position over and the first player, he would be what's called the uh, steer. He would say they know an ace coming up. You have a what, 52% chance of winning if you have an ace in your hand. Mm-hmm. And so they would uh, they would uh, know that that ace is uh, two cards down. So they might be sitting on a 17 and choose to hit on a hand that you don't hit on. It, you know, it's a, uh, it's a stupid play. 
But what it did is it killed that one card to bring out the card that that next player needed, the one that had the bigger, the big money on the table. That's just kind of a, a simple for instance. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, at least it's good to hear that casinos are the safest place to play. Yes. And like I said, uh, it's the players trying to, to yeah. uh, cheat the casinos now. And they have the software that can track cards. And it's pretty astounding what people keep coming up with. Mm. And speaking of players trying to cheat the casino or take advantage of the casino, have you heard of the Phil Ivey story that happened? Oh, yeah. Huh? What, I, what's your uh, opinion on that? Well, I, if the, that's called advantage play. If the casino is doing something that a player can capitalize on because it's a discrepancy in their dealing or, or in their dealing or the action of their dealing, and the player the player capitalizes on that, that's the casino's fault, not the player's fault. Mm-hmm. All right. So he he deserves what he did. He deserves the money he won. It should be his money. Yeah, I think most of the people in the gambling world agree with that. Apart from the Casinos, players, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh well, um, Richard, I want to talk to you about just to set the scene for how big a demand for a person like you in sort of underground games. You know, because I've heard mm-hmm. some stories that you've told on on other shows, and I'm definitely going to put all the links in the description because you've did some fantastic interviews, and people really. Uh, should check it out and you you are showing some of the moves as well there um, but can you tell me some of the most memorable situations you had with people from organized crime approaching you and offering you to to deal in their games uh, my name started really getting out there in uh, 1981 82 1982 i was on a tv show called that's incredible and back then, there was only three television networks in the United States, and then even the uh, and the other countries didn't even sometimes have, have that much. They had maybe had BBC, and that was it. And uh, and that show went worldwide, and so my some of my skills were revealed, and I started uh, getting offers. One of the first guys I'll just use his initials, uh, RD. He came to me and he heard what I could do. And he, uh, we sat down to basically lay our cards on the table. He was a mechanic and he basically worked a peak with a, with a strike second, second deal. And uh, I showed him the, the range that I had with the cards. And he said, I'll give you a thousand dollars a day to come work for me. Now, this is 1980, 82. So that thousand dollars a day with that then was good money. And then I said, uh, no thanks. Then he said, $2,000 a day. And again, I politely refused. Then finally he said, how much will it cost to buy you? Those were his exact words. How much will it cost to buy you? And at that time, the movie Godfather had come out a few years before and was a popular movie. And there's a scene in there where Kai was made a deal he couldn't refuse. And that's exactly what went through my head at that, at that point. And the guy actually pursued me for about six years. And he was... He actually became a friend and um, he would be my guest at the Magic Castle in Hollywood and he'd always have some beautiful babe, a different one. Every time I saw him, she'd go, oh, look at what blankety blank he bought me this new mink and this new that. And and he even gave me a, a tip on a horse race in one of the um, uh, tracks in a Del Mar Trace track. He said, oh, put your bunny to place on this bet, on this race. And I, I didn't do it, but my... Uh, my driver did check, and that the, what he said was going to happen actually happened. Um, and then one time he said, "Why don't?" Well, back up, there was another guy. I call him Mr. Gruff because he was kind of gruff. I don't want to use real names. Um, he invited me to his place in La Costa, which was the place where the mobs had their beach houses. And he made me a deal. Tried to make me a deal. I left, did my show, and you know, and went on. So now, Mr. Uh, cool, I'll call Mr. Cool, because he was he was very cool. And he said, why don't you just come to one of my operations? And he said, oh, and as, as we were going there, he said, I have to tell you, everybody here own mountains, with which is a euphemism, meaning everybody there are very wealthy. And we and the place that we went to, the, actually, the guy actually owned the mountain that we were going to. And the driveway was like a, at least a mile long. And and then probably three quarters of the way up was a guard, a two-story guardhouse. We 
and we had to go through the guardhouse, which was there to watch for raids and to just, you know, escort unwanted people off the property. Big, big place, go inside. All of a sudden, it was like walking into a Vegas casino. There were crap tables going, blackjack tables going. There was a, uh, a table piled with cocaine, uh, new dancing girls doing pole dances, uh, everything you could imagine. And the, uh, and so I, and I kind of went in disguise because I didn't want to uh, have people identify me because I, I, I had a profile at that point. So I decided to see what kind of work he was employing because he said uh, he had four mechanics that were working for him. And he said, I could do by myself what it takes four of his mechanics to do. And anyway, so I'm standing behind this table trying to just catch what kind of work uh, the dealer was uh, implementing. And the guy seated at the table playing turns around and goes, Hey, Richard, it's me, Joey. You've been to my place in La Costa. He said, now you're not playing here, are you? And at that moment, I thought, oops, so oh, dear, dear, dear. <laughs> and uh, I said, no, Joey, I'm just a guest like you. And he goes, because if Richard's dealing, Joey's leaving. Now, if I would have been behind that table, he wouldn't have been quite so friendly. Oh, yeah. And other times, uh, Mr. Cool would say, well, <clears throat> we'll play against other cheaters. There's this guy, he'll play 25,000 minimum buy-in. And uh, he said, what we'll do is we'll have the set up in a hotel room and we'll hijack the game halfway through because he was expecting the other guy to hijack the game. In other words, have a raid come in and st- steal the money in the middle of the game. Um, anyway, so that uh, and then finally t- twice, he and one of his business partners who was one of the top crime families in New York, no names mentioned. Um, they were uh, on the news, you know, because their operation was raided again. And it made me think, ooh, God, I wasn't there even as a guest. Uh, anyway, that was one. There was another guy who uh, owned one of the racetracks across the border in Tijuana, Caliente. That was uh, and he, and High Lie and some other gambling games, but he they they were very wealthy, very powerful family, and he would invite me to his home and and he uh, uh, said I have friends. He introduced to me to a bunch of his friends. He said these guys all have they're all self made millionaires, and they like to play cards, and they have friends that like to play cards, and we would like to invite you to be our dealer. And he said, you could earn your, you could win your own riverboat, your own uh, nightclub, whatever, you know, if you played your cards right. And uh, so then uh, probably one of the, uh, inter- one of the interesting uh, uh, offers came from the Middle East. Uh, I get a call, it's a very strongly accented voice. and said, I want to talk to you about doing business. And I said, meet me aboard the, the riverboat where I was the nightly entertainment. I get aboard the boat. It was a party of five men of Middle Eastern descent, and only one spoke English. And the interpreter threw a stack of bills on my table and said, let's see what you can do with the cards. I showed him, and then he talked to his boss in Farsi or, or Arabic, whatever it was. And he said, we'll give you $10,000 a week to come to the Middle East and play cards against oil barons, you know, the, particularly the Texans. And... Uh, I said, uh, no, thanks. And he was like, right with me. He said, what? You're turning down $10,000 a week? I said, yep. We argued with his boss in whatever language. Then he sent back and said, how about $20,000 a week? Nope. And then he argued again. And his boss was mad at him. And he's mad at me. And uh, finally, he kept going, $30,000, $40,000. He said, how about a million dollars? Now, he didn't say if it was by the week. But again, I said no. And they were so irritated. They lapped their napkins, threw down their forks, didn't finish their meal, and left. And they threw another stack of bills on my table. And that because there were so many, I thought there were ones or fives. There was a big old stack of $100 bills. So I had a good night. Didn't have to compromise myself. <laughs> and then this other guy I mentioned, um, uh, I call him Mr. Neurotic because he was always looking over his shoulder like he was expecting a bullet to come his way. <laughs> and, I, uh, and I told him about that offer. And he said, in the situation, don't take it. He said, because you'll be 100% used. He said, you understand what I'm trying to tell you, Richard? And for those that don't know what that means, 100% used means they kill you when they're done with you. I told him, I know what it means. He said, you know what? He said, those Middle East old men, they own half the world. He said, we own the other half. We can, he said, we can arrange to have these card games take place in the United States and we'll back you here. And at that moment, I actually thought to myself, wow, 
I'll be 100% used in my own country. I'll die here. That's what I was looking for, fresh U.S. dirt to plant me in. So, but do you have time for the, the, the craziest story? Go ahead. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the craziest story. <laughs> All right. This one takes a few minutes to unfold. I, I, had, I was married before to a, uh, a very sad woman. I'll just put it like that. Uh, needed, uh, I, I basically allowed myself to get suckered. I started off with a few phone calls and she would tell me this guy's talking about playing cards for two to 300,000 in Sin, in Sin City. And I said, Sin City's Vegas, not a safe place to play. Get a call from him, told him I wasn't interested. interested. I had just finished cheating a guy on a television series his name was Bobby Singh. He was a card counter, and he was going to show how he could count the cards and come out uh, uh, ahead with his card counting skills. What he didn't know is they brought me in as the dealer for that segment, and he never won a single hand. We filmed, we filmed for like two hours, never won one hand. He was so ticked. But anyway, so he offered to uh, go, on, uh, go on the road together. So I'm on a flight headed to meet up with Bobby Singer because we were doing lectures on card counting and, uh, and I would teach what to watch out for the ethics the card table. And see, this guy, I hear this newspaper next to me rattling. The guy lowers his paper and says, hello, Mr. Turner. We've spoken by phone, but I want to talk to you in person about doing a little business together. And I thought, how did this guy know what flight I was on? How did he know what seat I was in? And I thought that was sort of a, that's confidential information. And so he starts talking to me and he says, you know, he wanted to offer me two cards in a Sun City outside of South Africa. And he was a diamond broker and he, uh, that's what he did. But that was his main business. He wanted me playing these games. There was a large I guess, Jewish community that played high state poker there. And he wanted me to control, you know, the, to control the direction of the money. And uh, so we talked. I was kind of flattered that someone recognized me on the plane and made no deals. We landed, and I thought that was the end of it. That was just the beginning. I, I'm, on a, I'm, on, I'm in another, doing an, uh, another t television interview for another uh, show that we're doing in another city. I'm in my hotel room. Phone rings. Hello, Richard. It's me, Diamond. I'm going to call the guy Mr. Diamond because he was a diamond broker. He said, I'm downstairs. Let me buy you dinner. So I, I went downstairs and he didn't bother to, to uh, stand up or rate, shake hands. Welcome, he just said, Richard, have a seat. And he held his palm up in front of my face and said, I know your aversion to, well, you know, shaking hands. And I thought, how did he know I didn't like to shake hands? And it wasn't because I was weird or quirky, it's because people's sweat or the moisture on their hands affects my touch with the cards. So it's more of a practical reason than anything else. And uh, I thought, how did he know that information? So we're talking, he said, uh, you know, he told me how he's a diamond broker and he said, uh, feel this. And, you know, he had a, what he said was an eight carat pinky ring. And he said, take this. And he handed me a diamond ring about the size of a marble. He said, it's a $70,000 uh, pinky ring. It's a gift just to show you my good faith. And I knew if I accepted that gift from him in the long term, the big D word doesn't stand for divorce. It stands for death. And I knew if I accepted, I'd be married to the guy. And I didn't want to be married to this guy. So I said, thank you. That's okay. And he said, we'll make you a special ring. It'd be a royal flesh in, in marquee diamonds or maybe in rubies. And if you, this ring here, if you look at it, has an ace of diamonds in the center and a king, queen, and jack 10 on either side of it. Uh, but I did not, that did not come from Mr. Diamond, that one I had made from his idea. <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, so now I'm on the road again. I walk into a nightclub. They're waiting for me again, Mr. Diamond. I said, Richard, let me buy you a drink. I said, how do you know I was going to walk into this, this nightclub? I didn't even know I was going to walk into this nightclub. I didn't even know this nightclub was here. It just happened to be where we were staying. And uh, he's they, we sat at a uh, one of those small hotel tables. It was in a hotel, uh, a nightclub in a hotel, and those little intimate tables that just seats two. And he says, I know you're in the martial arts. And I thought, how do you know I was in the martial arts? You know, and for those that don't know, I, I've been in the martial arts since 1971, and I, I'm a, I have a ranking of a six-degree black belt. And uh, 
he said, now, if you want to take somebody out, and he casually put his hand on my shoulder, reached across the, the table, put his hand on my shoulder, what you do with it? All of a sudden, he, with, with the other hand, grabbed me by the neck and went to jet and smash my face against his forehead. He says, what you do is you take your, your, your head, you smash it against the punk's nose. I call it West Texas takedown, Glasgow kiss. He says, sometimes if you're lucky, the punk will bite through their own tongue. So it was kind of a little lesser than mayhem. And it kind of that guy at that point, it, I was a little, it basically scared me. And then he, uh, when we were getting ready to leave, he said, you're in the entertainment business. Perhaps you'd like to be on the Tonight Show. He said, take this. And he gave me a card. He said, there's three numbers on it. One was Johnny Carson, who was the host of the Tonight Show at the time. This is Johnny Carson's business number. This is his private number. The third number is an answering service. You leave a message and I'll get back with you. When I got back to my hometown at that time, San Diego, I gave it to a guy named Chuck Curtis, who was the captain of one of the most successful SWAT teams in, the, in, in our history of our law enforcement. He took down four serial murderers, including David Allen Lucas. And he said, with these mobsters falling, you need to be able to protect yourself. And he said, even uh, in a private game or in a situation like this, anything's going to, any confrontation is going to take place within four to six weeks, six feet. So he uh, had me out on the sheriff's firing range and he threw a rock at a target and I'd aim my pistol and fire it. And he armed, armed me with a Walther PPK, James Bond uh, gun of choice. Then, then it, but it turned out to be impractical because every time I traveled, I had to check the gun and it had to be in the, the airline's uh, suit locked case. So it was just dysfunctional. It was impractical to travel with a weapon. Cut to the cut to the story. I'm on a flight. I'm in another hotel. Waiting for me again is Diamond. He said, "Richard, sit down." He said, and then he said, he told me how it cost him four hundred thousand dollars to buy off a judge for a murder he had committed. I said, four hundred thousand is a lot of money." He said, "Not for a judge." And he said, "Now, if you ever want to have Jan Lee, that was the name of my wife at the time. If you ever want to have her." killed i can take care of that for you he said there'd be an accident an explosion boom no one would know you were behind the killing and at that point this guy had me uh, pretty uh, scared and so that's and i finally told him and i at that time i was in a making a move from uh, california to texas and uh, i told him i'm not interested please don't contact me again so now let's fast forward Oh, gosh, 20, 25, 25 years. Let's see, but maybe 25 years. Okay, I, 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 I got out of that marriage. She was a very bad alcoholic and a drug, druggie, and, and she kept trying to get me to take these mob offer jobs. So anyway, um, I'm married to my wife, Kim, of now 30 years, and um, I'm, I'm headlining in a show. And it was in, uh, it was going to be the Fox Theater in, uh, in, uh, in Detroit. We were opening there. And uh, I was there. The show was called Conned. And it featured four of the top hustlers in the world. Bob Arner, who's the foremost pickpocket in the world. Banachek at the top. Mental manipulator. Todd Robbins, the New York Times calls the king of cons. And I was king of con. And I'm considered the top card mechanic. And it was a really a great show. It was really fun. Anyway, we were uh, opening the show again, and my wife, Kim, was heading out to meet up with me for opening night, and she sees on her phone an, a message. And so she plays it, and it says, this is Dr. Uh, Al Alan Brazel. Uh, I need you to call me as soon as you get this message. So she calls him and says, this is uh, uh, Kim Turner. You uh, call, called me. And she, he says, I'm sorry to tell you, but your sister, Jan Lee Pickard, was found dead last night. And she goes, Jan Lee's not my sister. That's my husband's ex-wife. And he goes, oh, sorry for the mistake. Her profile shows that she calls you her sister. And then I had done a Facebook search and found that she had been tracking me and my family. And uh, so anyway... So she says, I'm, I'm headed to meet up with him right now. I'll call him. I'll let have him call you. So he calls. I call him. And I ask what happened. And he says, well, we don't really know. And um, 
And back up a bit, right before that, over the past, the previous six months, I kept getting these calls from what sounded like an Asian mobster saying, I want to speak with Jen Lee Pickett. And uh, I said, you know where she is? And I said, I don't, I haven't seen her in decades. And anyway, and I, I said, what's your name? I think, I think you're, you're not, you're, you're not legitimate. He said, my name, Vincent Price. I gave himself the name of an old famous actor. And I didn't believe for a second his name was Vincent Price. So anyway, I had those uh, suspicious calls coming and looking for her. So now back, fast forward to where we left off. Uh, I called this detective and he said that she was found dead last night. I said, what was the cause of death? He said, we have no way of telling because she had been dead for about five or six weeks, we figure. And in that room with her was three starving dogs. So she was basically eaten. And um, so to cut to the chase, I, uh, my wife, Kim, I told her about what happened and also about the suspicious calls that I had coming in. And, uh, and all over the decades, I thought Mr. Diamond had a private investigator follow me. And then my wife, Kim says, well, I guess I can tell you now who I think was the one that set you up with Mr. Diamond. And I said, well, who's that? She says, well, analyze it. Think about it for yourself. Take, eliminate all other, uh, situations, all other people and who's left standing. And because she wanted me to figure it out on my own. And I thought, well, who booked my flight next to Diamond? Jan Lee. Who knew at hotels I was in? Jan Lee. Who knew I didn't like to shake hands? Jan Lee. Who, when Diamond offered uh, two to 300,000 in Sin Sun City, when she first contacted, she said Sin City. And so I misheard it as Sin City as Sun City as Sin City. So I misunderstood her when she said Sun City because they sound so much alike. And then it finally hit me that it was her that, that was trying to set me up all that time. And so um, I told her I was in the middle of my show. And it was at the end of the show. I came out, I said, it had to be Jan Lee. And she says, I knew that. She said, I figured it out years ago, but it wasn't my place to say something bad about your ex-wife. So that's kind of the scariest dude that I came across. Wow. Wow, what a story and <laughs> what a twist as well. I know. Incredible, incredible. Uh, wow. Richard, you know what I want to ask you? Because all of the stories that you've told, you always say no to these people. And you also said no to the racetrack offer, which stood out for me, right? What's your reasoning? And I think I know the answer, but I want to hear it from you. Why did you yeah. always say no to all of the things, including including the guy giving you a tip on a racetrack? Well, for me, uh, playing cards, using my skills in that way would be unethical. It's basically cheating and cheating is stealing. And for me, stealing is wrong. And so, you know, so it's from a moral standpoint, I, you know, we, there's something in us that tells us what is right, what is wrong. We know that killing is not a right, is wrong. We don't know why, why do we know? Why do we believe that? There's some, some conscious that's in, instilled into us to know right from wrong. And so for me, cheating is stealing and I choose not to steal. All right. And, and, and with it, when it came to that horse track, offer, yeah. I almost made a bet on it. And, uh, and it was mainly, more, in that case, it was more procrastination on my part than it was anything else. Mm. Uh, and, and, and again, I still would have felt like I, was, uh, I had accepted a, a, an offer, even in that particular case, it would have had no commitments to it. But mm -hmm. there was still something about it that was a little bit seedy. And I rather earn my money. Uh, legitimately and honestly. And when I play, and I played for years, um, I, and I've done well, um, and yeah, even as a, as just a, a, a straight player, but I do not make my living uh, as a player. I did years ago, um, but I do make my living uh, as a entertainer, and my card work has been seen by over a billion people and then uh, the analytics show like 214 countries. And so I, uh, and, and because I have a high profile, you know, I have a, I'm with one of the biggest uh, speakers bureaus in the world and they take care of me very nicely. Mm. 
and we have everything. I learned it honestly. I have everything I could ever have imagined. Right, right. And you know what? That sort of resonates with what I talked about last week with uh, Michael Francis, who who used to be uh, a mobster, right? And mm-hmm. he moved on. One of the few people who actually got out of that life and um, is oh, wow. legitimate. But you know, that's exactly what he said in terms of crossing the line. Once you cross the line, you lose your integrity. There is no way back. And when you say that, you know, your work is now visible to people in pretty much every country in the world, you entertain people, you blow their minds with your incredible technique and your incredible tricks. If you accepted even one of those offers, this would never have happened because once you step one foot in, that's it. Once you're bought, you're bought. Once you're in, you can't get out. And so, and I knew that from the start. And yeah, I knew that from the start. So yeah. I managed to, to keep myself. Uh, and I'll, I'll just tell you one story that kind of really froze it in my head. I had this lawyer come in and he said, I would like you to play in my game. He said, you don't have to feel guilty about cheating these guys because we're all in the same business. We're all lawyers and bankers. And those were his exact words. His exact words where he said, if you ever used a lawyer, here's a chance to get some of your extorted funds back. And so I thought, isn't that crazy? Uh, 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 the pot calling the kettle black. In other words, he was a, a, a dishonest lawyer talking about uh, lawyers being dishonest, on, honestly talking about being dishonest. And I thought, well, what the heck? And so I, I did play, I did enter his game. And uh, we were, uh, there was one, there was a lawyer, my partner, lawyer, banker, and myself. And uh, I, I was dealing him the good hands most of the time, you know, and then I'd take some for myself. So it wasn't too one-sided. And uh, we were cleaning up. And then I, and, and he also thought there was a cheater in the tape, in the game. That was one of the reasons why he wanted me to, uh, enter the game to see if there was another cheater in that game because he always lost and he, the, the odds were against him losing as much as he did. So that was one of the other elements to the story. So all of a sudden I picked up the deck of cards and I said, there's two cards missing. And uh, the banker leans over and says, how can you pick up a deck and tell two cards are missing? And I thought, oops, I guess that showed a certain level of skill. So I said, well, anybody can tell that. And I started hemming and hawing, and, you know, kind of alibying. And I'm, you know, feeling around the table. And I bumped the placemat of the lawyer sitting next to the banker. And underneath his mat were those two cards. So he's holding out, which is a, you know, gambler's term for, you know, keeping cards out of, the, out of play. And then you switch them in as you need them. So he was holding out. And the banker looks over to my partner because it was his home and it was a very nice home catered. And that's why we had placements other things because there was all kinds of catered food to eat and so on. And he said, what gives this guy has cards under his mat and your other friend here can pick up the deck and tell there were two cards missing. So that's when the game broke up. Now let's fast forward two years. I was on a TV show called that's incredible. As I mentioned earlier, and this is when Jan Leith first got the idea that I had played for profit. I'm sitting in a restaurant and this guy comes up to my table and says, you're Richard Turner. You once cheated me out of a bunch of money. I'm the banker that wanted to know how you could pick up a deck and tell two cards were missing. And I thought, I'm going to get in a fight right here in this restaurant with my date. At that time, we were just dating. And all of a sudden, he grabbed my hand, started shaking and said, I saw you on That's Incredible. That was fantastic. Now I understand how you could pick up a deck and tell two cards were missing. He said, I just wanted to tell you, it was such a privilege to have been cheated by you. And he turned and walked away. <laughs> and, and so that I got lucky in that case. And that was a perfect example of if I would have been, well, what am I saying? I was <laughs> dealing, doing business. And uh, fortunately, the guy had a good sense of humor about it. And, uh, and, and it became a story that, uh, that I'm sure he's told many times before because he thought it was a privilege. Mm. Wow. All these stories, uh, Richard, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible. And, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Exactly. They go on that, forever and ever. And we haven't I, even told you our audience uh, a fraction of the stuff. 
Oh yeah, oh yeah, and there's so much stuff. In fact, because you've did so, you did so much in the field of magic, and I'm gonna again, I'm gonna put a lot of links in the description. You know, your performances with on Penn and Teller, Foolish, the show that was that was incredible, and uh, you know, there's so much more. Your your feats uh, with martial arts and some of the stories of uh, some of the crazy stuff that you did, and and your physical abilities uh, are incredible. We haven't even touched upon. Uh, the subject of you losing sight as uh, as a young boy, uh-huh. you know, and and we're talking about card mechanics. You know, you you've mentioned the move uh, of peeking the card. Mm-hmm. For you, technically, that would be pretty hard to do. Yet, but in my case, you that still, would not apply. Exactly, but you still can do way more. So, talk me through it. Is but, is the deck marked? Well. When, uh, as I described earlier, when I told you how far I could push the envelope, let's say the deck is face up, mm-hmm. not to face down, but face up. So you okay. can see every card coming off that deck. You've chosen five players. You chose a third position. You chose seven card stud. And you're taking those cards out of my hand and shuffling them up every time I go around the table, even if the deck was face up or the deck had a giant embossed K on the K and a eight on the eight, how would it have been conceivable to have done it? So that's that when, when that subject comes up, I say, think about that. And then I've actually, I've actually d- done uh, shows where I took a stack of business cards or postcards and took four of them and put uh, a and an S under it and a A and a C under for Ace of Club, Spades, Diamond Club, Heart. And then I do some of my show with a stack of business cards or postcards. In fact, a quick story uh, for when you and when you watch some of these shows, you know, I can within between a half a second to a second and a half hand you a, any exact number of cards called out. Someone wants 37 cards, I can hand them 37 cards. Someone wants 13 cards, I can hand them 13 cards. And um, so uh, this guy saw me do that on That's Incredible, you know, which was almost 40 years ago that was filmed. 1981 is when it was filmed. And uh, I went to buy some carpet for one of my homes in San Diego. And they go, hey, you're Reggie Turner. I saw you on TV. And we said, I'm, this is my place. I'll help you find your carpet. And we're walking around. He goes, that is so cool how you can hand people exact number of cards. He said, between you and me, you have a special deck. They have little notches on them, little indexing system. I said, I can do with any cards. And, go, and he goes, no, that's, I, I don't believe that. I said, I can not only do it with any cards. I can do it with a stack of postcards or a stack of your personal business cards. So now I picked out my carpet. And it was an expensive carpet. And we're in his office and another customer comes in and he had his business take cards on the desk. He hands one over to him and says, call me and we'll talk about it. And then he remembered my statement. He said, are you telling me you can do it with these? I said, sure. He says, let me see you do it. I said, well, you don't work for free. So why should I? He said, I knew it. You can't do it. I said, tell you what, if I don't get the number of cards you ask for with your business cards, I'll pay double for the carpet I picked up. You already have my credit card. If I get it right, you carpet my house for free. And it was his place. He goes, I'll go for that. He asked for 17 and I handed him 17 and he carpeted my house. <laughs> That's just a little aside. But, but, but getting back to a touch, you know, I'm actually the touch analyst for U.S. Playing Card Company. All your gamblers out there are familiar with the bicycle deck, B deck, steamboat, steamboat, Hoyle. All those cards are made under one label, uh, under one uh, company, U.S. Playing Card Company, Cincinnati, Ohio, except they just moved over to Kentucky about five or six years ago. And I'm their touch analyst because my fingers, uh, they are, are more precise than their measuring devices. And so I will, I can tell you the caliper of a card, you know, 11.3 thousands versus 11.4 thousands or the, the embossing depth, the the moisture level in the card, you know, all kinds of things that make for a user-friendly card, a good quality working card for the table. So they've employed my hands and I have been their analyst for 20, 20 some, 25 years now. And, uh, and the president of the company, uh, Mike Slaughter, you know, and, and, the, and his director, his scientists, his scientists uh, in charge of uh, 
of the research and development, you know, when they'd have me test cards, what they would do is they would take two dozen decks and each of them are pairs, okay? And, and maybe they just changed the chemical, one of the chemicals in the coating. So not only did I have to find the two decks where they changed the chemical, I had to match up all these two dozen pairs. Now I'll, I'll reduce it down to say six decks so it's easier for you to get a, a picture in your mind. So I would have to say, oh, deck one and three match, two and four match, and five and six match. And it was five and six that you did, uh, you changed the coding. And this is my, what I say about that change. The cards lost some of the right period or maybe the right period went longer. Right period meaning uh, the, once they're broken in, how long they last before they start breaking down. And I, and I had about a dozen tests, things that I would tell them uh, to help them improve and maintain the quality of their product. So, um, and, and then uh, backing that up to what Dr. Ogus, the neuroscientist from Harvard said, uh, because of the fact that I lost my sight, so we're now revealing to your people, uh, which is something I talk about if it becomes relevant, and if it's not relevant, I don't talk about, but I have no vision at all. Uh, my vision started going south when I was nine, during my teens and 20s, it was measured at 20 over 400, which is twice as low as what's considered legally blind with no macula, which is the center part of the retina. So I have no, at that time, I had no forward vision. Out of the corner of the eye was uh, 20 over 400. And then my 30s, it all finished disappearing. My sister, Lori, had the same thing happen to her. We both got scarlet fever, and we think that that's what caused the degeneration of the retina. Anyway. Uh, Dr. Ogus said that because my haptic and tactile neural network, which is the part of the brain that relates to touch, uh, is just highly developed. And it basically bullied its way into my visual network. And so those two networks have combined. And he said, that's why I have one of the most uh, developed tactile neural networks on planet Earth, in his words. And uh, so it's kind of, a, there's a, some, in other words, there's some physiological, biological reasons for the world, reason why I'm a little on the oddball side. Mm -hmm. Well, that and practicing for 14 hours a day for 26 now, years. That's, <laughs> that's, the, that's the flip side. That's the other half of it. It's one thing to have a gift of some kind. Uh, but it's another thing. You take that gift and you drive it in, you grind it into the ground. A musician has a tremendous ear, a tremendous voice. Uh, if they just don't use it, they don't practice it, uh, that's one, they, then they don't, they don't hit the heights that they could have hit. But if you take that gift and then you drive it into the ground, then that's when you can attain thing, obtain things that others have considered not possible. And that applies wow. in a lot of areas. Richard, I don't know if we still have time for this, but I would like um, to get into some, maybe leave the, the viewers with uh, some practical advice, you know. Uh, and what I mean is, because of course it's unlikely that in, a, in your regular home game, somebody is going to encounter, you know, somebody of your caliber. But you've mentioned already so many things that can happen, you know, just putting the cards under the mat, you know, picking the card, signaling the partner, uh, players signaling to each other, all these things. What would you say are the key things to watch out for and pay attention to for an average poker player? And to qualify that, that is where the hustlers hang out now, are in the private games. I had a friend who, who was, uh, he had been arrested three times in Nevada for, uh, well, he was, a, he was a machine a machine mechanic. You know, he knew how to fix slot machines, but he's also a top card mechanic. And I, one time I gave him a call and just to visit with him. I, he said, I'm in the middle of the game. I said, are you, in a, are you doing business? He goes, yep. And uh, so he was, uh, business is a term for me and you're cheating. And you heard that expression, you use that expression, doing business is a slang term for taking care of business. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, uh, so anyway, one of the things, always cut the deck. That separated the amateur from the professional. When the casinos stopped allowing the deck to be cut by the player, that that put, that put takes and puts it a, a 10 times easier. Getting around the cut made it a, a whole lot more difficult. Always cut the deck. And if, 
if they'll let you complete your own cut too, because I can uncut the deck in less than a half of about the time it takes to blink an eye. And, uh, uh, and, and also a deal from the table. But that once again, that doesn't mean you still can't be cheated because the cards could have been stacked. Just watch the dealer, watch the players and watch if there's any, any eye contact between players uh, or hand movements between players. You know, they're, they're signing up or signaling to each other. Watch the, friend, the, the friendliness, if you would, between players. Um, but anyway, it's, it's, there's just so many things to, to watch out for. Basically, know who you're playing with and against. And uh, in the long term, if you have the same players or players at the table with an equal amount of skill, the money should basically circle the table. Over the long, from over years, years time of playing, that money should have just circled the table. If it's not circling the table, if you haven't pretty much equally won as much as the other players, then I would get out of that game. Hmm. And what can you tell about the shuffling machines? Uh, the shuffling machines that uh, you're talking about in private games or in the casinos? Well, in the private games. In the casinos, obviously, they're certified and uh, all, the, right. all the procedures there, so it's pretty yeah. safe. But yeah, that, uh, if we talk about the yeah. private games, it does the, give the illusion of, okay, there's a machine, so we can trust it, but yet, who certifies it? Yeah, that's, that's a safe way to go, is use a shuffling machine, because uh, it's harder to get a rigged machine than it is to get a uh, rigged, rigged fingers. So I would say a shuffling, uh, a shuffling machine at the table, and then once again, allowing the deck to be cut or further sh uh, give it a, 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 another shuffle, not by the dealer. Mm -hmm. um, Tony Giorgio, who was a mechanic, he was the movie in the, the, remember the movie Godfather, the guy that stabs the guy's hand to the bar with a knife? Oh, yeah. yeah. That, that was uh, Tony Giorgio. He played Bruno Tataglia in the film. Mm -hmm. He was one of the top card mechanics, and he and I battled each other for 38 years. And um, he would, uh, what he would say is, if you're in a heads-up game particularly, I, I would shuffle, then uh, you would have a, fr uh, you would give the deck one more shuffle after I gave the deck my shuffle, and then I would then deal it. But that's, that's only in a heads-up game to cut down on business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if we talk about a situation, let, let me describe a situation, which is, you know, some of the high stakes games are usually run like this nowadays, where you have a shuffling machine, you have a dealer, uh, the dealer takes the cards out of the shuffling machine, cuts it, uh, puts the, the, the card, uh, what is it called, you know, the, mm, the, cut card. the cut card, the cut card on the bottom, right? Yeah. So, Theoretically, at no point there's any peaking involved, unless obviously somebody on the side of the table is partnering up and they see the bottom card or or the middle card. But that shouldn't be too helpful anyway. No, that's a safe. What you described there is a safe game to play in. It, you you it would there would be have to be quite a bit of collusion going on to have business taken care of mm -hmm. being taken care of in a situation like that. That sounds like a, a safe way to play. Right. So basically, the, the games that people really should watch out for is, well, definitely, I don't think people play dealing themselves very often nowadays, especially if we talk about the high stakes environment, right, usually right, right. you would just get a dealer. But yeah. still, if you have yeah. a dealer, there... That's as the far as I know, that gets I, scary again. That gets scary yeah. again. Because now, like I said, I have friends, that's what they do. And I, I've had people try to get me to do that very thing. So that's where it gets scary again when it's not going around the table. Because when it's going around the table, if you have a cheater, that's only one in five times. They have five players that they have the deck in their hands. This, if you have a guy that's able to do anything, he has the deck in his hands ever, after every deal, after every play. So that's a, a, a little scarier scenario. And I know that's more common because it, makes it where the players can take care of the, enjoy the play. And some people are uncomfortable shuffling. Other people are uncomfortable dealing because mm -hmm. it's just not a skill set they have. So they would rather have someone else do it. But that does open it up to having somebody at that table uh, uh, taking care of business for whomever their partner may be. And if you see the, like I said, if you see the odds of play not uh, playing out over the long term, I would be suspicious. Yeah.
And of course, we didn't even touch upon all the technology that's available, you know, oh, with yeah, all the market crazy. cards, with the mm-hmm. infrared, uh, this and, and whatnot. Yeah, that's and, right. You know, there's there's so much to watch out for. I mean, we can't even, the list is too long. We can't even go yeah. through the list. Um, and I know the people that make those and uh, it's just the technology is is really amazing. I mean, they, uh, they, but I, it's crazy. It's, it's totally amazing. And even the FBI, um, uh, one of my friends that what he does, even uh, under scrutiny, of uh, the FBI in there when they were trying to figure out what was going on, it's uh, it can almost pass those type those type tests. Mm. Wow, and yeah, and it's incredible to think that you know in the high stakes games environment, there's always going to be demand for people like you. There's always going to be people who are going to seek out your help, and. You know, you've been offered a lot of money to to partake in these deals, and yet you always said no, which we all should be very thankful for because now we see all your fantastic wor- uh, work, uh, and it's all public and it's it's beautiful. But there are a lot of people who would say yes at the first opportunity, and that's quite unfortunate. Yeah, and the, and the thing is, then you have no life, you know, because then you have to keep a low profile. How you have to launder your money, you have to hide your money. You know, if you're if, if that's what you're doing and you're making significant amounts of money, you know, you, you can't have the houses you want. Um, you just, it's just a, it's, you have to keep a low profile. And uh, for me, I rather have the uh, opportunity of, of openness mm. and being able to have what I want and, and have it legitimately. Yeah. And plus, on top of the, just the openness, uh, what you've mentioned uh, earlier in, in one of the stories, uh, you know, if the stakes are high enough, they might just use you 100%. That, that is exactly, and that's the end exactly of that right. story. Yeah. That is exactly right. Uh, they, when they're done with you, you're dead. Yeah. And, I, and I'm, I live in Texas. I've been in Texas since 85. And I can tell you a lot of hustler stories. And the, uh, uh, I, I almost wish I, I would have got some interviews from this guy on tape. Uh, because he knew where a lot of the bodies were buried from uh, people got caught that got caught either doing business or they wanted to hide the fact that the guy was doing business for them. Wow. wow. And they, were end up, they ended up dead. Mm. Richard, it's, I think you have an appointment coming up soon, so I want to wrap it up because uh, I, I suppose you don't have much time left, right? It's, it's a oh, bit past uh, yeah, 11. A few more right? minutes. Huh? All right, all right. Um, yeah, because... I want to first of all say I am like I've mentioned already a couple of times that I'm going to direct people to all of the work. Um, well, most of the work that is available, at least on YouTube there. And I highly yeah, encourage yeah. everybody to check it out. I think it's absolutely incredible. And uh, your skill is unparalleled. And your dedication, your obsession, you know, we're talking about cards here, but the lessons that can be applied to any endeavor. I mean, the, just to see somebody go so fully immersing themselves into one art, into one skill and perfecting it every day. And right now, as we speak, you're, you're shuffling the cards, you're working with the cards and that's, you're not wasting a, a moment. You're so efficient and it's so <laughs> inspiring. I appreciate that. <laughs> that's nice. And, uh, and we've been shuffling these cards for an hour now. Watch, I'll cut a high card. You see what it is? Uh, you can. Can you lift it up a bit higher? Because we can't. Okay, that's the ace. Yeah, ace, ace of spades. Yeah. 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 So I've been sitting here shuffling ten thousand times, and <laughs> I I'll do it, cut right out of the middle again. Mm. Anyway. <laughs> This is incredible. And I definitely will put some links to, yeah. to and, the videos and where the people can that, see your, your uh, performances. Yeah, just uh, richardturner52.com or uh, Google Richard Turner. The, I'm the first person that shows up and there's uh, many, many things and shows that you can watch. And then they made a feature documentary on my life called Delt, D-E-A-L-T, like Delta and the Cards. And uh, that they can get on Hulu, Amazon Prime, Google Play, any any video on demand platforms, mm-hmm. and they're also um, in negotiations of turning my life into a feature film. 
So that's something that's coming up that you can kind of watch for. And, oh, really? And that that is incredible. Yeah, how far exactly. the process? Uh, how far are uh, you in the process? Well, I'll, I'll I'll actually know more in two days. Oh, wow! But things uh, we uh, we have some significant uh, players involved, so I can okay. say for that. And the person they want to have play me is a. Uh, right, right, uh, and another and, very, very. You would know the name right off the bat. Who, who my wife says, man, he's a hunk. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! And and then, uh, uh, and then for, just for gaming, you know, I also uh, you watch out for. Uh, you know, I I've created a, a couple of gambling apps. So I have ga gambling games. I started working on them thirty five. One of them thirty five years ago. The other one fifty. Five years ago, when I was 11 years old, now now there's a, a tremendous market out there. One's going to be Shark Showdown, and it, it, it combines the elements of blackjack, which is the most popular banking game in the world, Monopoly, which is the most recognized board game in the world, and poker. And it takes the the elements of each of those, and I and I weave it into its own entity. And so one of the smaller versions is called Shark Showdown. And the big game is called Texas Showdown. It'll be something that you'll be able to play with your friends online and for either what's called real money gaming or just for pleasure or just playing against the app. But uh, the engineers should start uh, putting those things together in the next uh, few months. Oh, fantastic. So it's coming out soon. It's not, not it, out it, yet. It should be out this year. No, it's not yet. It should okay. be out this year, though. Uh, three different uh And, and it does sound like a pretty sweet combination, the yeah, it, poker it, it, monopoly it, and black it, it, Yes, and it, I took the elements of each of those that make it just addictive, if you will, or alluring, and, uh, right. and, 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 and blended them into uh, it, its own entity. Like I said, if you mix, if you put those three together, things together, and they had a baby, they'd come out with Texas Showdown or Shark yeah. Showdown. Yeah, very interesting. You, you took... Uh, Blackjack, which apparently is not addictive enough, and poker, not addictive enough. You mix it all together, add some Monopoly on top, and, uh -huh. and you make something quite addictive. That that sounds like a great idea. Fantastic. Um, well, if we still have time, I mean, I don't know. Are are, are you going to be interrupted at some point, or because if we have time, I might as well. Talk, if if you have time, I would love to talk to you as as much as possible. You know, but well, if you I'm have to go, the, we can. Yeah, wrap I, it up my, as well. my, I know my. I'm I'm being waited on right now. Oh, uh, okay. Well then, the, the, let's let's. Uh, we have another one more question, one more subject to cover. We can do that. Uh, yeah, fantastic. Um, what? Should we talk? I have a multiple mul multitude of questions that I want to ask. Um, martial arts, <laughs> um, walking martial tie rope, swing on the trapeze, high <laughs> falls, <laughs> shark hunting. The fact that you know I'm what? Certified. Actually, actually, now that we talk about it, you know these things that you've mentioned. My question would be: Why? Why? Do you do some of these things? For example, the shark hunting or shark wrestling. You you were even wrestling oh, a shark. I've heard that know. story. You know, tra trapeze, uh, all the high jumps, cliff jumps. Uh, you've ridden a motorcycle, not being able to see, and and you had a guy behind you who can't hear, and you thought it's a great idea. And let's go drive a motorcycle. He's gonna you know alert you to where to go and. Uh, and yeah. it's going to work out. Why? Why? Well, part of it when I was a little kid, I was always the smallest or second smallest in my class. So I was picked on. It. And then when I started losing my sight, I was teased. And I didn't like these bullies. And I thought one day I'm going to learn karate and kick in their faces. And so that's when I started training in the martial arts and uh, started training with uh, the weights and uh, all different forms of, of physical activity. And uh, I didn't want to be that coward out there. So I started pushing myself to the, to the points where people thought that I was just an ad ad adrenaline junkie, which in many cases is true. But it, uh, that was the reason why I did it. I wanted to see how far I could push myself in each of the areas. When I got my black belt, it was one of the most difficult tests 
in the country and, and, and one of the most difficult tests in the world. I had to fight a 10, three minute round bout with a fresh fighter each round. It'd be like Muhammad Ali fighting Joe Frazier, Foreman, Holmes, Spinks, one after the other. He's the same person getting tired, they're fresh. And uh, it was covered by ABC and it was on the front page of Los Angeles Times Sports section. Um, so it was, it was just, uh, I just have this uh, something in my makeup that has to take things to the limit. And, uh, um, and uh, it's been very fun. And of course, I've, had, I've suffered for it in many ways because I'm 66 years old now, but I still have a six pack. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but, um, but, um, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, it was, it was, it was just fun. You know, I, I worked with Bob Yerkes, who was the top stuntman in Hollywood and he's 89 years old. Uh, we would, I would train people for the circus of the stars and wonder woman series. And, uh, uh, that's where I learned to swing on the trapeze, walk a tightrope, take, take high falls and I'd cliff dive and climb thousand foot cliffs. Um, it was, just, it was just the, uh, the challenge if there was something there, I had to see if I could conquer it. I, I can't really tell you what was in my makeup that made that pushed me so hard, other than I'm a certified oddball. And I'll tell you how you become a certified oddball. I'm sure you, everyone out there is sort of Ripley's Believe It or Not. And uh, I was on the TV series Ripley's Believe It or Not back in 1984. And I'm actually an exhibit in the second largest Ripley's in the country. And I'm in the 2015 issue of Ripley's Believe It or Not Book of Eye Pop and Oddities. I received a certificate stating that I am a certified oddball or oddity. So you might be an oddball, but I'm certified. <laughs> so how can you beat that? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm a certified Richard, oddball. Richard, you know, another thing that I want to ask you about is... Because the numbers you're you're quoting are incredible. You know, you you've practiced average fourteen hours a day for twenty six years. I've heard somewhere you saying that you haven't missed a workout in like forty five years or something like that. Yeah, uh, 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 in June, in June, I haven't missed a workout in forty nine years, three months, and uh, what day of the week are we in? Twenty uh, in about 50, in about. Uh, 18 days <laughs> wow why how how did this level of commitment this level of discipline how do you maintain it it's it's more of a case of how do i stop it people they say put the cards down uh, you know it's more of a case of of you have to uh, restrain me than the other way around i don't it's not that i have to force myself to do it I have to force myself not to do it. If there's a case where I need to stop and back down because I'm in a place where it would be rude to be practicing. Um, so it's more, it's more of the flip side of that is, you know, as, um, um, as my wife said, you know, this is not the time, put them down. We're at a funeral, um, you know, show respect. We're at church, show respect. And even then I will pull out my blank cards I have a, de a deck of cards that have nothing on them. So that way people think I'm just playing with paper, but I'm still practicing my moves. I can imagine the setting at the funeral and, I, and you having that conversation, yeah. Oh, I've had that conversation many times. <laughs> <laughs> and Richard, but also like, it's not just practicing. No, you, you say I'm practicing the move. It's always you're taking it to the most efficient, to the, to the extreme when it, I suppose it applies to your workouts as well, because it definitely applied in your martial arts. You didn't just go for martial arts; you went the very, very high level, you know. And and same with seems seems to be the theme with almost everything that you you did. I know. I don't know. I, I I'm embarrassed to say, but I just had to be whatever someone else did. I had to be better at. I don't know, you call it ego or whatever you want. Um, uh, I just had to take it a step further, like doing the splits. You know, I a 180 degree split. Oh, that was a piece of cake. I did a I did a 190 degree split. I would uh, I'd stretch myself across two chairs in the full splits and put my touch my head to the floor. 
when it came to uh, weight training, uh, I got my first degree black belt in 1984. I weighed 168 pounds. When I first started training, I weighed 110 pounds. I was a little scrawny, a little rut, and I'd get beat up by the girls. And, uh, and then when I got, it took me 13 years and three months before I was ready to take on the 10 fighters. And 13 years, three months, and five days, but you should be precise because that's just the way my brain works. <laughs> okay. Um, and and I, I, I distracted myself from my point. Um, uh, it bring me back to my point. <laughs> that, that was a case of the old brain. What do you mean by, oh, oh weight, weight training. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I had to uh, push myself, and I topped out at 340 pounds on the bench press, which is at 168 pounds, uh, as I was saying. When I got my first degree black, by the way, 168. 30 years later, when I got my sixth degree ranking, I weighed 168 and six ounces. So there was six ounces difference from uh, 30 years apart from one to the other. And, uh, and so what, uh, when I would be in the gym, uh, I could curl more than my body weight. Most weightlifters can't curl their own body weight. Uh, so it, whatever it was, I just had to take it to the, to the extreme. So like I said, I'm just a little bit on the uh, obsessive side. In fact, I call myself the poster boy for obsessive compulsive behavior. <laughs> <laughs> and pleased with it. <laughs> but you know what? It's not uncommon of somebody willing or wanting or hoping to take it to, you know, Olympics beat the rest whatever. and become mm-hmm. the best and all of that. It's not uncommon. A lot of people want to do it. Yet, you seem to be able to do it in so many avenues. Yeah. And I think it's that particular makeup that, that whatever is in my way nothing gets in my way. And people say, how do you, how do you not get depressed? Or how do you, uh, to me, it's an adventure. It's the journey. I love the journey of whatever, whatever it takes to get from A to Z, all the stages in between are part of the adventure. Uh, So I, I always tell people, don't look at the end result enjoy the process, enjoy the journey. And as you're doing, in the, as you're in the middle of the journey, take it to its limits. Mm, wow. That's beautiful. That's really beautiful. And it must be one of the things that allows you to, to achieve what you're, you're, you're achieving because you are enjoying the process for somebody who's just looking at the end goal. You know, it's, they are dreading, the next morning when they have to go back to the gym, mm-hmm. they're dreading. And like you said, for you, you have to find a reason. You have to be forced not to practice. You have to be forced not to do something because the whole practice part, uh, the process, the, the road is the joy for you, not so much the end result. You're exactly right. Uh, I want the end result, but it's the journey that I love. I'm, I don't get excited about what's coming up tomorrow, the next day, to a level, to a certain degree I do. Once it's there, then I get excited. In the meantime, I'm excited that I'm having the time to spend with you. And that's what I'm enjoying at the moment. Mm. Wow. Yeah, that's that's very powerful. And I, I wish that more people would live uh, with that set of principles. Yeah, well, the, it makes, it makes uh, all parts of life fun. And like I said, the challenges, I hear I lost my sight and, and I'm well known throughout the world. And so people would look at that as a, as, a, as a disability or a challenge or whatever. Look at it, like I said, as part of the adventure. It's part of the journey. And, and each, each, yeah, each day there's something that's going to come along in your life, in all of our lives that we have to deal with. Look at that challenge, that, that situation as part of the adventure. It's like reading a novel. Who wants to read a novel? Oh, he just won the lottery. He just was the winner at the Olympics. Oh, now he won the Academy Award for this. Who wants to read a book like that? Boring, <laughs> right? We want a book that has uh, ups and downs and, 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 and conflict and challenges. 
you know, then it becomes exciting. So life for me, my journey is, a, is an adventure. It's a book. And, uh, and I don't want a book that just goes from success to success. I want the challenges and the battles and the fights in between because that's the parts that, are, that I, I think are rewarding. Mm. I see. And Richard, if we have a few more minutes, I would love to ask you another question. That uh, Certainly. All right. The question is, you've developed so many new techniques, techniques that people thought impossible in, in the field of card mechanics. Where did you find the ideas, the inspiration, and... Excellent question. Um, Di Vernon, the man, we mentioned him earlier. He was known as the professor, the father of close-up magic, and the one that spent most of his life seeking out gamblers around the world. He would trick me. He tricked me. I would work with him for 17 years. I had the privilege of uh, acquiring a century worth of his most guarded card table artifice, his most guarded card table information. And he would say, Richard, this is how it's done. And because at the time I couldn't see exactly what he was showing me, he would, I'd feel his hands or I'd get really close and he would not show the me, him being able to do the move. He would describe how the move should be done. And the thing is, it was later on that I found out that he was describing the things to me, the moves, the techniques, the controls in a perfect manner, in the way that he wished he could do them or he wished they could be done or it would be the most deceptive way of accomplishing it. And because I believed he could do it, that was my starting position. And, that, and then I would, come, I would sit there and work obsessively and I'd come back and he'd go, that's it, that's it, that's perfect not knowing that he couldn't do it, nor, so, nor anyone else was able to do it. And then he'd give me another task. He said, I wish you, this is how you want to do this. And so I would go and I would make it happen, come back and find out that, that they would go, that's perfect. And it was like I said, years later that he admitted to me, he made them up. He just wanted to see what the obsessed kid would come up with. <laughs> so that's, that's part incredible. Of it. That's incredible. Well, that's, that's part of it, but that that's, a part that is easy to understand. You had a mentor who was guiding you, pushing, and, and yet, you know, also the fact that he had the vision of how he wants things to be done, knowing that, you know, he can't do it and nobody else can do it, but yet he knew and he could explain to you, apparently, how things are supposed to be. That, that is quite impressive in and of itself as well. Yeah, yeah, because in a, because in a card game, the way people hold their cards in itself can be a tip-off. If they're framing the deck, if they're what's called a mechanics grip, if they're holding the deck where they're almost hiding the deck is because they're trying to hide their dirty work. And as he said, I, I don't know what you do, did, but I know you did something. You know, so uh, people, they may not see the move, but because of your actions, that tips, tips the player off to something you're trying to do something. And so his theory was naturalness. If you can do things in such a way where it doesn't look like there's no effort at all, the cards are just kind of laying in your hand and you still are able to get that card out of the middle, bottom, or second. And then, then it, it will fly over fast company. Mm -hmm. Wow. And he's right, of course. I mean, yes, you oh, have time to, he was right. You and have and to. If, when you compare my technique against any other card, your top card man out there, you'll see a distinct difference in the, my method of dealing seconds, bottoms, middles, whatever it is you watch. You'll see that there, they are, there's a, a softer, more natural uh, action in my dealing and my different techniques than you, when you watch any of the other top card men out there. They, they all basically started from Erdnays, uh, which is a book written in 1902 on how to cheat at cards, basically, called Expert at the Card Table. And so that's the, the, really the foundation that most people started with and went from, even though I did uh, hear some Erdnays as a kid, uh, but I did not have, I did, I did, I wasn't caught up in that particular uh, uh, technique of uh, handling and holding the cards. And then it was Vern that pushed me away from that, that direction because he knew in a, in a card, card game that would uh, create suspicion. So 
his idea is to figure out how could things, how could this be done with thumb, with all the fingers showing, with the deck completely exposed and so forth. And, uh, and so that's how he would describe it to me. And that's how I would develop it, even though it was like I said later, that I found out that he himself could not do it. But what was his motivation for going for realism in the card game? Because it's not like he was planning to, you know, no, well, that was just his obsession. He was his, he was obsessed with gambling moves, cheaters, and hustlers, because that was the most closely guarded information in all of sleight of hand. Just about everything else in sleight of hand that's out there, you can go online, you can find books on, but there are certain things with the cards and the gambling work that is far more closely held than uh, the techniques to uh, fool people with card tricks and so forth. Mm. So um, he, he, he was just obsessed with finding out these methods and then being able to execute them without people even beginning to think something, something happened. I'll give you a, a, a medium quick story. All right. Uh, I, I was, per, uh, I was, it was my performing venue and this guy kept going, come over here, we're gonna play some cards. And I, I was I was already finished with my performances. My shows were over. I wanted to have my lobster with my prime rib with my creamed horseradish, which was my favorite dinner at the time. And uh, and I I said, how can I help you? Went over. He said, sit down. We're going to play some poker. I said, sir, you don't want to play cards with me. The conditions I can control the game under are: you can shuffle and cut the deck. You can choose the game, choose the number of players, choose the winning position. I'll make it happen. Just sir, you're sitting there. And uh, he said, well, sit down. And so. And then usually I, if I would, if I'd start dealing seconds at that point, they would back off. I thought, okay, this guy is such an, he was so obnoxious. I thought I'm not going to, I'm not going to give, let this guy off the hook. And he had two other players the people at the table with him who were very nice and very differential to him for whatever reason. So we sit down and we start, we, uh, I said, how many players? He said, four of us. I said, who's going to win? He said, I am, of course. And we were, I was just getting ready to said, hold it. We're not doing this for nothing. So he started off with just 20. He said, he made everyone pull out a 20, put it on the table. So I said, okay, whatever. And I dealt him, I dealt him a winning hand. He jumped out of his chair. He had kings over 10, full house. He said, I told you I always win. I said, buddy, I just told you, you can shuffle and cut, choose a number of players, choose a winning position. I'd make it happen. You think that was a coincidence? And he said, what are you talking about? I'm the one that shuffled. I'm the one who told you I was gonna, uh, there was four players. I'm the one who told you I was gonna win. I thought, okay, now I understand your conditions. Sit down, let's keep playing. And for the next uh, hour, hour and a half, um, a week, I kept winning and he kept having to break 100 after 100. And you know, he kept wanting to up the stakes to try to get his money back. And, uh, and his two friends that were there with him, he made them put up the same amount of money every hand. So either they were all very wealthy or he was their brother or sister or their boss. I don't know what the relationship was, but they were almost apologetic for his attitude. Yet they put the money up every time they lost a whole pile of money right alongside him. And then I finally stood up and said, well, thank you. It was a nice time. I said entertainment and the manager of the place was standing behind me during this. And he goes, that was so cool. He said, uh, he said, I have to play nice to this, these people. This guy was a total jerk to everybody in this place. I have to play nice. You don't. And he said that was just, he just got a big kick watching me just whip him. So now I went and had my lobster. And then I hear uh, the, the server said, this guy wants, somebody wants to talk to you in the stern. When I go down there and it was the same guy he said, we're going to play again and we're going to up the stakes and I'm going to do all the shuffling and we're going to make sure every card comes off the top. And, uh, and so so I said, okay. And then I, dealt, I was dealing in slow man. I said, are you watching? And he just so badly wanted to get right on top of that deck. And not half of my moves were square, were honest. As I'm sitting there and I'm telling him, I'm going in slow motion. I said, you watching carefully? And I'm so drawing his attention to my hands as my hands are doing dirty work. And uh, again, another four hands, another pile of money lost. And uh, again, I said, thank you. Next time. You might consider playing on your own dime, and you know, versus forcing for forcing forcing his friends to play. So the rest of the story, I I meet up with the the lady that was served served his table, 
And she said, that guy was such a jerk. He asked me who you were. And I told him, you're one of the top card mechanics in the world. And he was a fool to have played cards with you. And that's why he wanted to play you again. He thought forewarned would be forearmed. And, uh, and, and then she said, and then I also told him he was beat by a blind guy. Now, how'd that make you feel? And uh, that's what she said, how'd that make him feel? And so I pulled off four large bills, handed them to her. I said, here, have dinner. Compliments of Mr. Jerk. And so I go out to wait for my chauffeur. And I'm uh, out and I could, my, my martial arts sense, you know, it's called critical distance, uh, you know, situational awareness. I could sense somebody was around and I'm sitting, standing there on guard. And all of a sudden I, I get, someone comes up from behind me, grabs me in a bear, bear hug and hisses in my ear. Give me my money, black, you blind cheater. I'm going to kick your ass. And it was Mr. Jerk. And, uh, and of course, martial arts give them put them in a bear bug one of the stupidest things you could do i just reflexively you know slam my head back drop down into a what we call a horse stance breaking lowering my center of gravity at the same time i spread open, uh, broke my arms spread my arms out like a bird opened their wings which broke his grip at the same time i smashed my uh fist into his groin while my boot heel went down and scraped down his uh shin and then drove my heel into the, his foot. Now he's kind of screaming and cursing at me. And he's like, I'm going to kill you. And he came running at me. And I caught him with a step across side kick. Right? And because of his angle, that caught him right in the lower ribs, which caused him to, to go away, basically leave away whimpering. So that's the rest of the story. I don't know how we got on that topic. But um, my, oh, the point was that I was doing it, what Vernon was saying, in slow motion acting like nothing's happening, no tension in the hand at all, as I'm sitting there just dealing the cards and not a card is coming off the top. We can't see it though, Richard, because it's... Uh, yeah, it, the angle is wrong. Yeah, yeah the angle but, is yeah, wrong. But they'll see it. There's they'll, they'll all see the it different movies definitely, and the yeah, shows. I'll, they'll see it. They'll I'll see, see it in a better way. That, that's a, that has to be shot where it can be seen. Yeah. And you know what, when you were telling the story up until the moment when, uh, when the guy attacked you, I was thinking uh -huh. to myself, maybe he was just there to fish for information. You know, that was his investment in trying to see your moves up and close, you know, because as you said, this uh -huh. information is very well guarded. So to be able to sit close up with somebody and see him do the thing you know, potentially that could have been, but you know, once we know that he tried to get his money back and attack you, that, yeah. that is highly unlikely. That's, that's what and he then, was and, right. And then now there was another situation where that was the case. And this was, uh, I, it was at Martha's Vineyard, which you maybe you've heard this one of the places the presidents will go and, and retire to not retire, but you'll go have a, a few days of vacation. It's a very upscale, uh, place, uh, off the coast, East Coast. And I was hired to perform my professional show. And it was for the CEO and his VPs of not one of the Fortune 500, not one of the Fortune 50, one of the Fortune 20. And uh, it was a German chemical company. I don't want to say the name, but I'll say you they're slow. I'll tell you they're slow. We don't make the things you make. We make the things you make better. If you can figure it out from that, you know what company I'm talking about. And I bet you do. <laughs> anyway, so we're at Martha's Vineyard and I uh, did my stuff and it's the end of the night. He says, now you can join our game under these conditions. We know how tricky you are with your fingers. So when it's your deal, one of us shuffles first and then you have to lay that deck on the table and you have to deal those cards from off the table. He said, because I know it's impossible for anyone to cheat under those conditions. And if you can do it, go for it. But I know it can't be done. So, you know, it went through my head at that point, point, two things. One, he was challenging me. Two, he implicitly gave me permission because he said, if I could do it under those conditions, I had his blessing. So he gave me permission if I could do it. And of course, that's one of my more deceptive ways of, of manipulating the, the outcome of a game is leaving the deck on the table and dealing for off the table. And all night long, I kept feeling straights, flushes, full houses, and he would slam his fist on the table going, there's no way you can be cheating. And, and he was, was more amused than anything else. And really when it, what it got down to is he just wanted to find out 
if it was possible to control the game uh, with the deck on the table. And so that, that gets back to what you first thought about uh, Mr. Jerk. In this case, uh, th that was really more his motive. He, uh, he lost, I turned a, a four-figure payday into a five-figure payday. Mm -hmm. Wow. And once again, it's just the we scratch the surface. There are so more, <laughs> so many more stories. I know. All you have to do is just name a subject, and darn if I don't have some silly story to tell on that on that subject. Because yeah. I've been around a long time, and my life has been nothing but one adventure to another. So mm. I have uh, the stories added up, or the situations and adventures added up. And also, I just want to put like a. Um, wrap up the the story about how you came up with some of the moves because you know we we discussed how mr vernon uh sort of tricked you into manipulating the deck of cards in a very natural motion you know and that was something unique to you and not many other people could do it but once you gained that skill and different types of skill you were able to combine some of those techniques into creating something that nobody even thought of ever creating and You're the only exactly reason you right. could do that is because you you went into several little pathways where nobody else went and then you could combine the whole thing in one yeah and a, a way of kind of putting in a, a, a word picture for people it's like you learn how to you're on a piano you learn how to play raindrops keep falling on my head you learn that the, the chords to play that one song. Okay, you got all those chords, you got one song. I always say, I always tell people, don't learn to learn how to do a trick or a one thing. Learn all the scales on the piano. You learn all the scales you can play any song put before you, rather than just learning enough to create and accomplish one thing or two things. Learn how to play all the scales. And then uh, because I've learned all these, so many different techniques, that I have a dozen ways of accomplishing the same thing. And then the what I mentioned earlier about the conditions you can shuffle, cut, choose a game. Professor Vernon, when I first approached him with that, saying, what do you think about combining this, this, and this? And we were at the Magic Castle in Hollywood. Sitting, and he, was, he was sitting at the bar, and I was standing telling him, and he goes, can't be done. And he said, you, your brain cannot work that fast. Your hands cannot be that sensitive. You'll break rhythm. You can't do it. And at that moment, I was depressed. I sat there going, this is the ultimate. This is the perfect combination of uh, uh, combining this and this in the most deceptive way of taking a shuffle deck and controlling the outcome. And so for about 10 minutes, I sat there depressed. And then all of a sudden, it occurred to me, because he was saying it can't be done. And I, all of a sudden, I thought, hold it. But I can do it. And I said, Professor, come watch my show. And after she goes, Roger, what the hell are you doing in there? I don't understand what the hell are you doing? I said, remember when you said you can't do this and this? Well, that's what I'm doing. I don't understand how the hell you can do this. And for the next 18 months, every time we were together, he'd go, Max, Max, come here, come here, watch this, watch this. Whoever was around, he would have them just pull them, up, pull them over and shuffle the cards. How many players do you have? Where do you want to sit? Over and over. And then two years later, he said, still don't understand how the hell you can do that. And he it's knew exactly incredible. what I was doing. Yes, yeah. that's, that's the interesting. He knew exactly what I was doing. And, and two years later, so I don't, I still don't yeah. understand how the hell you can do that. It was just Especially it, because he is the person who came up with a lot of the moves that you he, you were using. Right? He, so he was even, the author. Even then, he still doesn't know. Yeah. Crazy. Oh, he, he, well, he just didn't believe it could be accomplished. He mm -hmm. knew what was going on. I would say to no one to do are two different things. Like I can tell you. It, 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 like that's like standing in a hammock making love while juggling nice seven ice cream cones. You can describe it, but go ahead and try to do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. And you've mentioned a, a beautiful thing. Don't learn one trick. Learn the scales. Uh, scales, you know. Scales, exactly. When you practice, let's say you are fourteen hour or. Well, let's be more moderate and let's say your five-hour day, mm -hmm. five hour of practice. How do you go about it? Do you have a specific idea in mind for the day or do you just naturally go with it? 
No, your first is the, is the primary answer. I have an, uh, a specific objective. Right now, I, I've been working on for about six months a particular way of, of stacking the deck would be the easiest way to explain it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so I, I work on that, and I will sit there and do it over and 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 over. And over. And then I got to get to the point where I do it in front of under heat, in front of people. Um, so that is the first thing. And then in between my objective, I will then maintain my other skill sets of, you know, then I'll go into maybe spending a, you know, 20, 30, 40 minutes or an hour practicing a particular, my, my standard moves that I got to keep up on because of the difficulty in them. Like when I do the particular second deal, I deal, and they, it's, they call it the Turner Sweep second. Uh, my thumb has to apply the precise amount of pressure to push over exactly 22.6 thousandths of an inch. And with this deck of cards, that's the caliper of two cards. So as I'm dealing, I have to be able to feel exactly the, apply that exact amount of pressure to, to, to hit those two cards perfect. And then as my right thumb is dealing the card, I only have a fraction of a blink of an eye when my thumb is crossing over the medium of when it passes by the edge of the deck to engage that second card and deal it out. And, uh, and I have in that one move, I've done it like 5 million times in front of a live audience. And I've actually done that move over a hundred million times over the course of 45 years, 45, 45 years since I first started, started working on it. Uh, so that, that kind of gives you a little more um, uh, background. And, and back to your question, uh, I, I have an objective, and then I, fig- I analyze the objective. What do my fingers have to do to accomplish the objective? What do the cards have to do? How can I make that look uh, totally natural and follow the same uh, etiquette of the game during that point in the game? And then I figure it out, and then I practice it in super slow motion, as I mentioned earlier, until I, I have that move embedded into my, uh, my mind, and then I turn it into a subconscious habit. But so the objective is the first thing. I'm objective first, and that's what I practice. Then in, in between, to break things up, I'll just go through my basic repertoire. Mm-hmm. And speaking of the objective, one, when do you know that you're done? When do you know that I'm at the level when it's my move now? It's it's natural to me, and then it goes into your maintaining the the move kind of. Yeah, I, actually, I don't ever consider myself done because, uh, like the my the second deal I've I mentioned, the turn of sweep second, I've done it that way for forty years, and when you watch me on Penn and Teller, which was filmed two years ago, since then. I've modified it. I've upgraded it by uh, just a tiny change of one of the fingers. And uh, so I constantly am analyzing what I'm doing and how can I make it a little bit better. So something I've done for 40 years and taken to a, to a, to a level that there's, there's four other people in the world that have been working on that second deal. One, one of my friends, Jason England, he's been working on it for 30 years. And he's probably one of the probably one of the top three, four in the world that that can do it. But even then, um, uh, they they still don't do it on the on the same level, and they still can't put it to its actual function, other than just demonstrating the move. So it's one thing learning the move; it's another thing being able to take it and put it to its purpose. Mm. And the purpose being. In this well, case, in, well, in that in that case, being able to take and as I'm dealing around the table, I'm controlling certain cards to go where I want them to go, and with a second deal over a bottom or a middle deal, bottom deal and middle deal, it's always as you're going around the table. It's if you if you if you're if you're controlling the game for yourself, it's honest, 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 dishonest, honest, 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 dishonest, honest, 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 dishonest. If you're middle dealing. Honest, 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 dishonest. Honest, 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 dishonest. So no, no, let's put it in, I'll, I'll say it in a way that people understand. Honest, 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 bottom deal. Honest, 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 bottom deal. Honest, 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 middle deal. Honest, 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 middle deal. 
with a Stefan deal, what makes that the harder of all the moves, even more than a Senate deal and put it to its purpose, is you don't know when that there, you can develop a rhythm with uh, when, when you know all the ones that you want are coming to yourself. When you're doing a second deal, you don't know when it's going to be. It might be honest, dishonest, dishonest, honest, 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 dishonest, honest, dishonest, 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 honest. The, that's why Vernon said that it, it, you can't do it because of the rhythm in the dealing uh, to because of the randomness of when you are controlling the cards to where you want. You don't know when that's going to come into play. Mm. All right. Now I see. Yeah, because I, I didn't understand initially why he said your brain cannot work that fast. And now I understand you can't yeah. keep track yeah. of the cards as fast, especially with the randomness in there, because there is no pattern. Exactly. And you have only a fraction of a moment to to decide which way you're going to go and engage and then change. Mm. So okay. you're very, that's very observant of you. That was a very astute uh, observation on your part to put that together. Good for you. Well, thank so you. It shows I'm being interviewed by a smart person. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank a you smart person kind of is, inter is interviewing this crazy guy. <laughs> well, you know what? I can't even say that you're not crazy because <laughs> you absolutely are. You know, one of the most fascinating people that... I know of really. I mean, it, it's just incredible. And I think the story when people are, and I hope people are going to dive into, you know, your documentary and some of the other uh, podcast interviews that you did. I really like the one with Tim Ferriss because you, you go into some personal aspects and it's very fascinating. And the thing about your life, there are so many takeaways to different type of people, right? There's obviously a lot of takeaways for card mechanics, for the magicians. But beyond that, there's the just the takeaways of, you know, the thing you were mentioning about enjoying the process, enjoying the road. That's a philosophical thing that applies on a very broad um, matter. And the way you approach practice and, and perfection, it's inspiring and you know, when somebody would say, all it takes is just 26 years of 14 hour a day average practice, you would say, well, this is impossible. Much like Mr. Vernon was saying, well, this is impossible. It can't be done. I don't know of many other people who did anything for 26 years, 14 hours a day on average, not just. That's what, yeah, that's why practice, I said I'm, a, but I'm the, on the next side. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's incredible. Your your story is amazing. And and Richard, thank you so much for your time. I know you have uh, some other things today planned, and I know that your your schedule in general is so busy. And uh, I really appreciate you finding the time. Oh, it was um, my pleasure. To talk to it was me. My pleasure. And and just for your audience, you have a wonderful voice. You have a great voice for what you're doing here. Oh, and you have a thank very you. soft manner. Yeah, you have a very very uh, good theatrical voice oh fantastic thank you that's that's really good to hear um richard um Shall we i am lost for words i'm lost <laughs> for words it, it's been so inspiring in many ways and it's been so instructional and i hope you know we opened up the curtain for some people who were oblivious about some of the things that are possible in a card game right and I'm not being pessimistic and you are not being pessimistic about all games being rigged, et cetera, et cetera. But that being said, we need to watch out for some specific things. And especially with the, all the technology coming in, you know, there's, there, there are a lot, a lot of things to... Oh, yeah. And, and we're getting off on all kinds of more stories there. We don't want to start because they go on forever. Yeah. But you're right. Technology and the, and the things that can take place are pretty darn amazing. Mm. Oh, well, Richard, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate this. I will put all the links, everything in the show notes. And okay. I hope people follow you. They go check out your documentary and the upcoming movie. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. I really yeah, hope that that's project gonna be, goes That's going to be very interesting and very amazing. I'm going to be this, you know, that have a stuntman, they have what's called a stunt coordinator. 
Mm-hmm. My friend Bob Bukas was a stunt coordinator for the like Wonder Woman series or yeah. Six Million Dollar Man or Arnold Schwarzenegger swinging through the uh, shopping center. You know, they, someone has to coordinate those stunts. I'm going to be the ham stunt coordinators in the contract. So I will be coordinating with the actor, teaching him how to do certain things because almost every scene, he's going to have to have a deck of cards in his hand. He can't just be holding a deck of cards doing nothing. So I'm going to have to teach him how to imitate and mimic all of my different uh, techniques, even though that person will not be doing them dishonestly, he'll be doing them mm-hmm. honestly. And then we'll uh, possibly CGI in um, the, uh, the, me actually doing the, the real moves. But uh, anyway, my point is I'm the stunt, hand stunt coordinator. Yeah, I'm. I'm sure that uh, you know whoever you're going to be coordinating is is already quite scared, knowing that you know your <laughs> your uh, uh, how how should I say limits to what you think is okay to do. Uh-huh. <laughs> He's probably already worried about yeah. some of the stunts you, you're going to be coordinating. Yeah, I know, especially because not only does he have to be able to uh, do the hand stuff, he's going to have to be a top athlete. He's got to know how to fight. There's all kinds of other elements within the story. And, uh, you know, it's going to have to be a, 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 I'll just put it, pretty buff guy. And, and you've <laughs> seen photos and stuff of me in my years. And oh, yeah. I was, you can tell that I'm not a weakling. <laughs> yeah. I started off as a 110 pound weakling, but I got pretty darn strong. Mm. But even to this day, at your age, you know, your physique is uh, so impressive. I mean, it's like a poster for not missing a workout in 49 days, uh, 49 years. 49 years so yeah. You see where I'm coming from. For me, 49 days of not missing a workout, oh, that, that sounds like a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and because my, my one of my philosophies, I'm not going down. People told me, wait till, you're, wait till you turn 30, it's going to start hitting you. Turn 30, got stronger. Where do you turn 40? Where do you turn 50? Where do you turn 60? But I do have to confess now at 66, um, I've had so many injuries from all my high impact living that the parts are uh, showing their wear and tear, but I still get out there and do it, even though the wear and tear is showing. But I would not trade the fact that I'm having to deal with the, the worn out parts for the for the... Well, let me put it another way. Those that didn't do it, they have other issues. They're fat, they're overweight, they have high, high, high blood pressure, they have uh, uh, just uh, multiple the, the issues that just go on forever. So my issues are all like a, a broken part of a, uh, a shoulder that had to be repaired, new knees, you know, pieces that had to be fixed right, versus just an unhealthy body. Mm. Yeah. And on top of that, most of your issues are pretty much self-inflicted. Yes, that is so true. Mine were self-inflicted. Or some, I put myself in a position to let them inflict them on me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I took a roundhouse kick to my left left knee, and that cost me my left knee. So, but it was me that got in the ring with the guy. Yeah. And I remember there was a story, or this is, again, I don't know if you have to go because i could talk to you forever you know I, I enjoy this conversation so much it's, so it's really up to you you stop me whenever okay. you you are in go, go, go ahead and ask this question because we'll... no, uh, i remember um the story about right before uh, performing for pen and teller you had a hand injury oh well that's a good what, what happened was i went i would i went it was the third season and I, so i then I, I was going to be on the show and we actually had the Delt uh, crew. They were going to come in and film Penn and Teller uh, for the for the movie. And so I went. I had a friend named Doug Gorman. We went to the Rio Gym. That's where the Penn and Teller have their shows at the Rio Casino. And I paid seventeen dollars for my workout. I should have got it for free because I was part of the thing. But I paid seventeen dollars for my workout. And there was a workout bench. If you can, you know, the, it's one of those adjustable ones that you can make it stay straight up or you sit down here and do your curls or military, or you can move it part way down to like tricep extent or lay it flat and do your bench, uh, bench or, uh, or I was, I was just doing it until I was going to do my leg, leg lifts there. And so, but the bench would not go down. I pulled the pin. What the heck is wrong with that? And then I felt up and it was pinned up against the wall. Somebody had butted it up against the wall. So what I did is I, pulled it 
away from the wall. And what happened was that bench went like a giant clamp on a, and just crushed my most important digit, my my left dealing thumb. This is the thumb that 80% of what I do depends on this one digit. And what was my response to that? Dang it. And so I called my friend. I said, Doug, bring me a bucket of ice and don't ask any questions because I paid $17 for this workout and I was not going to miss my workout. So I, for the, I, I did ice for three minutes, worked out for three minutes, ice for three minutes, worked out for three minutes. And then I, I said, okay, Doug, I'm ready to go back up to my room. And then when I got there, my thumb was as big as my toe. I said, uh-oh. And then I called the executive producers, Lincoln Hyatt and Andrew Golden. I said, Andrew, Link, I don't know. I can, I can do this, but I won't be able to do any seconds. I won't be able to do this part. He says, what are you talking about? You're going to the emergency room. And so I ended up in surgery. And uh, I told the surgeon, and I, uh, he's a top hand surgeon, uh, and I, I told him, I said, don't put me out of this is the end of my career. I want to be awake for it. And I said, I also want to film it. He goes, well, you just put my anesthesiologist out of business. So uh, we'll film it. And so uh, I, and, and you can watch. And I said, my, my anesthesia was shuffling the cards with my other hand. So I do one hand shuffle with my right hand while my, uh, le- by, while my left hand is being operated on. And it starts off with him you know, taking a spoon shaped thing and popping my thumbnail up like the hood of a car. And then he said the bones in the thumb were crushed. They said it looked like the hood ornament of a, of a Mercedes Benz. And uh, so he, uh, he cleaned out all the blood and, uh, and so on. And then he took the thumbnail and sewed it on here and here. And then like the hood of a car, front end of the hood of a car, sewed it down here so it stayed put. And, um, but it took a full year, almost to the day, for that, uh, that thumbnail did not take. A new one came in and said, yeah, three, cho- three things will happen. Either this thumbnail will reattach itself, or you'll go a new thumbnail, or you'll end up with no thumbnail. Fortunately, the situation was I grew another one. It took a year before it finally grew out, and it was like literally the Friday before my Monday opening for the fourth season of Penn & Teller that my manicurist was able to buff my nail down and make it look like a the normal thumbnail. So when it came out, it was wrinkly and half, half was thicker. It was, it was messed up. Um, but anyway, that was, that was a, a life career threatening moment. And, uh, and like I said, if you want, if you want to watch it, you can just Google crush dealing thumb, crush dealing thumb on YouTube and uh, I have to give fair warning. It's very graphic. And there's two versions. There's the longer version and there's the, the, the trimmed down version. But both of them uh, are, are pretty darn graphic because it, it, it gives people the willies. But, but anyway. <laughs> wow. And, but you still, like, you, as you said, almost to the day, you know, it was last minute. You mm-hmm. can perform now. You did the performance and you did it amazing. But could you practice? Like, how how did this preparation go leading oh, oh, up to that? Well, uh, no, I still was able to perform. I did my first show after the surgery a week later, even though I was not supposed to, but I was already scheduled. And I just wanted to see what I could do because I had uh, the nerves in the finger, in the thumb here were severely damaged. And at first it felt like I had a balloon over my, over my thumb when I would be dealing with and operating, manipulating the cards. And slowly, I guess, the sense of some of the sensitivity back. Uh, but I was, a, I, I, I was able to do my stuff and I was performing. I just, my thumb just looked bad. And then I did another television show uh, halfway during that year period. And uh, we had, they, they did, they put on fake thumbnail for that, for the, for the shows that it did, that I did in the interim to make it look like I had a regular no, thumbnail, my manicure, put, manicure stuff, put on a fake thumb nail and then did what they call powder and powdering, which is taking, I don't know what it is. It's that manicure girly stuff. Mm-hmm. How does that, I mean, I'm just thinking about the idea of, you know, you have your thumb crushed. You just have an operation. A week later, you're okay to perform. 
your managers must have been uh, pretty mad at you. They, they would probably... Oh, yeah, would, yeah. oh yeah. Oh, big time. Uh, because I have had, I hate to even admit, I've had so many surgeries because of my high impact living. And this is the way I approach it. Uh, I've had seven hand surgeries altogether. Not just one, seven. I've had, from all the years of punching, they had to cut me all the way across here, pull the ligaments and put them, uh, to reattach them. And I've had a couple tunnel in both hands and they had to do the same surgery over here. They had to remove three bones out of the back of both of my wrists from, uh, from, like I said, all the years of punching and, and don't, uh, you, I know you, everyone's going to say, why is he, his life depending on his hands and he's punching. I don't, don't get me started on that because I've been teased and criticized and say, why, why, why? It's just, I had two parallel little, little things that I liked. I want to be a martial artist. I want him to be a card shark. It's just they kind of cancel each other out in some ways. So, um, but what I would do is I, uh, after each hand surgery, I'd go in, usually it's Friday that Dr. Coleman would do the surgery. I'd get out of surgery at noon. But first time, 10 o'clock the next morning, I was back in the gym. You know, uh, less than uh, 20, 22 hours later. And, and of course, the one arm is in a sling. Uh, so I'm not stupid. But also what I would do is I'd work out the other three parts, three quarters of my body. And because the other body, that life healing blood that's in us, that, that our creator put in us when we were made, would still go through the injured part. And it accelerated my healing, my healing tenfold. I had one time, I was 10 days after a surgery, and my right, my, I, like I said, I, I've had this, both procedures done on both hands, back and forth. And I would, uh, my one hand would be almost as big as my foot, you know, just a week after the surgery. And I went in, my wife and I, we did a 150 minute nonstop workout, 102 hours, uh, to a, to a, um, two and a half, almost two and a half hours you know, without taking a breath in between sets and reps. And what happened was it flushed. I thought it flushed 50% of the swelling out during that one workout. And I had just come from the therapist and the doctor. And I went back, I said, you got to look at this. And they always measure your hand to see how, how, you're, how you're progressing on your, on your therapy. Mm -hmm. And they had measured it that particular day. They said, you didn't go down 50%. You went down 60%. So I had a 60% reduction in the swelling over one 150-minute workout. And so um, that's so that after each surgery, I would uh, I had two new knee replacements. And in, in those cases, they don't even want you walking stairs or anything like that. And I I, I literally got out of the surgery, out of the out of the hospital on for the second time uh, on Thursday and I was back in the gym the next day, the next day, the first one, the first knee replacement I got out of out on a Thursday and went back to the gym on Monday, but I still did uh, uh, some kind of physical, physical activity of one sort or another uh, based on where I was at that point, at that point. In other words, I've been in the hospital, I'd go for a, a mile, run, walk, yeah, and so on. Mm. You know what? And it sort of makes sense considering how how you approach the other aspects of, of your practice, for example. Because as you were saying, you know, if you have free time, why idle if you can do something? If you can shuffle the cards, if you can work on a technique. And I suppose it's the same principle, you know, sure, you, you can't use your arm, for example, but like you said, you still have three quarters or more of your body available for the workout. January. So why not, why not just go for it? Yeah. And like I said, then the accelerating of the heart, accelerate that blood through the injured area. And it just, uh, my wife says he heals faster than anybody. And, it's, and that's, I, that's the reason why is most people are complaining about their, they hurt, they're in pain. Surgery is painful. Uh, to me, all pain is, is just something that hurts. I just ignore it. And, um, and so, like I said, I would, I would uh, be back in the gym and it does take some fortitude because, uh, uh, you know, to do something when you're hurting and you're down. Or, in fact, I had, so here we get off on tangents again. 
uh, you know, I've had to have three ablations. And all the top martial artists, Master Roy Kerbin, Grandmaster Roy Kerbin, he's had ablation. Chuck Norris had ablation. Bill Superfoot Wallace had ablation. And it's because we pushed our hearts beyond, you know, what was world-class uh, uh, training. We pushed it, you know, and so the, it caused the electrical part of the heart to foul. That's what an ablation does. Is it, 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 the electric part of the heart is not firing uh, on the, with this all eight cylinders in the sequence that they should. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I had one ablation and uh, I told the doctor, Dr. Uh, Reich, I said, okay, doctor, I might be an AFib, but I have a show at seven o'clock tonight. So two o'clock, no matter what the situation, I'm out of here. He says, you're not going to know what you're doing. You're not even, you're not even, not even going to be clear of the anesthesia. The anesthesia takes 24 hours before it wears off. You'll, you think we're talking and stuff and you hear us talking back and forth. You're not going to remember what you, what you've done or what's going on. I said, I'm still out of here. I was out of there. My son said it was one of my, one of my better shows. I was the, the highlight of that particular event. And uh, so in other words, I, I, I hope I, I'm not coming across as sounding too boastful or whatever. You ask questions and there's just an answer to the question. And I'm trying to be honest and give you an answer to it. It just sounds like the guy's either crazy or just the most strange, arrogant son of a gun on the planet. Take him. I'll take them all. Well, you know what? It makes sense, especially with the way you approach life. Like, why wouldn't you do these things? Why stop? Why why take the days off? If you think you can do it, just go and do it. The only thing that is stopping you or could be stopping you is if you don't believe that it can be done. And you have did, did so many things that a lot of people thought cannot be done. A lot of really smart people, especially in your own field, in your own art, you did things that, you know, so many people would doubt you. And I guess that's a character trait that allows you to just say to the doctor, listen, I'm out at two. And that's it. That's the end of that story. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so that, that, that gets back to what I was saying earlier is I would, uh, I would have it uh, a procedure done and go right back in, right back into action. And it was, it was tricky with the performing. I'd say it was tricky, but I would be back behind a deck in times that they, I, I shouldn't have been, I should not have been out of the cast. Same with my, when I got my new knees, um, I would, uh, uh, well, I don't want to go, uh, I don't, I don't, I can't even really remember the details on it, but the doctors just told me, whatever you do, don't tell people about this because they're going to give them false hope because I'd be back to full capacity within days. And, uh, and most people, you, you, they just try to get you to get a hundred, a hundred, uh, 25 degree bend on your knee after six weeks and I would be there within well, on the second knee surgery. I was, I was at the full extension before I even left the hospital. And I don't, I can't give you an explanation for it other than there it is. Mm. <laughs> yeah. But the subject of doctors is a, is a whole, whole other thing that that's a whole yeah. other thing. And, and I, and I argue with my doctors, my, so I've had three rotary cuff surgeries. I won and won my right one. I, I, I won the match, the karate match, but I lost the war because, because I literally took the entire weight of that guy with my one arm and slammed him to the ground. And it took, cost me my rotary cuff, but I won the match. But I never told the guy that I lost the war. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, uh, but and I would argue in my my shoulder surgery, shoulder shoulder surgery. Go, he said, "You can't do that." Because I was out uh, fishing for uh, uh, I caught seven seven foot sailfish and it was one nine foot marlin and two mahi mahis, four foot mahi mahi. And you can actually see though one one of the, one of the times on on Delt that mahi mahi that where I eat the eyeball. Mm-hmm. I chopped down the eyeball in the movie. That was uh, one of the trips. That, um, but um, my point is, I lost track of my point. Children I'm getting old. <laughs> what was my point? <laughs> we get off on so many tangents and yeah, we stories. Started, we yeah. started about the doctors and the, and you. Oh, the do- yes. Oh, yeah. That was it. My and my soldier surgery would say, 
don't do that. You cannot be fishing for those big uh, fish right after the shoulder surgery. I said, what are you talking about? I'm the, the pole is held in a harness and I'm just pulling with my whole body. And we'd literally be yelling at each other across the, his office. And of course, it, it was all in fun because he was a cowboy. He did a surgery in cowboy boots and, uh, and, and we liked each other. But, it, but we would literally be just screaming at each other. You can't do that. Um, yeah, why can't I do that? Yes, like, you know, literally like that. But like I said, it was in, in fun. But at the same time, I wasn't backing down. And I just... I just can't get over the fact that he did the uh, surgery in the cowboy boots. I know. I, I, yeah, <laughs> I, Miller, just when really... I thought this, the story cannot get weirder. <laughs> and then it, then it does. <laughs> yeah, he always has cowboy boots on, his surgery in cowboy boots. <laughs> oh, wow. I am so happy to just think about the people who haven't heard about you before and are going to go into deep dive. Because I remember the first time I encountered information about you, which must have been, I want to say, like probably two years, maybe even more ago. I don't remember what was the first thing that I saw. It must have been either Penn and Teller or Patrick Bed David Show. Patrick Bed David Show. Uh -huh. uh, it must have been actually Patrick's show. And I remember from that moment, I, I went, I, you know, obviously the, the documentary, reading up on you, watching, watching all the um, recordings of the early shows that you did wow. and, and some of the techniques. Uh, it, it is so fascinating. Because at, at one point um, in my life, I also got obsessed with card mechanics because I had mm -hmm. bad experience. Well, Bad experience. I had experience of being cheated in a in a card game, right? In a in a private card game, and there was card mechanics involved. And obviously, I didn't spot anything. Um, but I went home and I got my hands research. on all the information that I could get, right? And as you said, there's not much information out there, but still, there's basic information is, is plentiful yes. on YouTube. And I went for. Um, slightly obsessive run of about three months of studying the techniques. And I had two of my friends who were active uh, dealers in a casino coming over for dinner, mm -hmm. unsuspecting of anything. And I just, uh, you know, after you know, some drinks towards the end of the oh. night, I, I told them, listen, listen, you, you, come, come and see. Come and see what I'm going to show you. And uh, I just did, did the normal, you know, three, three shuffles, the cut, dealing, mm -hmm. dealing the hand. Um, to three people, right? We were three people. Obviously, you know, I, I gave one of them kings myself. I got the, the aces and then I got the ace on the board, right? And so they didn't spot anything, wasn't suspicious. So I said, well, let's do it again. You know, I, I'm going to do exactly the same thing. You're going to get kings. I'm going to get aces. You watch me. I did it three times. They couldn't, they couldn't tell. At which point I realized okay, if these guys can't tell that I'm doing this after three months of practice, what chance do I have against a professional who does that for a living or, you know, does that for years, for 30 years or, or more? I have no chance, especially in a, in a poker game environment where I'm not even paying attention to what's going on. Like the, what dealer is doing is the least of my problems there. I'm probably involved in a conversation with a, with a fellow poker player or, you know, I'm thinking about something. Mm -hmm. At which point I was like, yeah, okay. Uh, it's, it's impossible. It's impossible to spot these things. And the thing is, as soon as you, if the dealer or the cheater thinks that there's any heat coming on, he stops. You have all night playing. It doesn't matter where the money is all through the night. It only matters where the money is at the end of the night. So people think that the professional will cheat every time it's their deal. No. They might do business one, two, three times during the whole night. So mm -hmm. that's all it, all it takes. It doesn't matter where the money is through the course of the night. It only matters where the money is at the end of the night. Exactly. Exactly. Like you said, it's all it takes. Just a couple moves in a long it's session. It's as long as they, as they, yeah, key moments and key 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 pots, key key hands. Yeah, Richard, and, uh, 
thank you so much. I, I want to say I, I've been saying thank you so many times already, but I really, really thank you. I, I was looking forward to this conversation so much, and uh, I feel like we covered some of the things that I'm so glad to discover because I haven't heard some of these stories before. And you know, I really appreciate you sharing your stories, wisdom, and everything that goes with it. <laughs> and everything oh. else that goes with it. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, it was my pleasure and and goodbye and and watch the dealer and always cut the deck. Oh, that's that's a great advice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Richard, thank you so much. You have a good day. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to get a regular email from me personally where I share my key takeaways from each latest episode, go to runchexpodcast.com and subscribe to my newsletter. And of course, I would really appreciate if you subscribe to my channel on YouTube and rate my podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or any other platform where you normally listen to your podcasts. This really helps.